Echo is one of the best games I've ever played. Echo is a game about a musky boy and his terrible friends who go to a ghost town in the middle of nowhere and have a terrible time, and it's one of the best games I've ever played. It's honestly kind of surprising, because on paper this furry gay dating sim psychological horror visual novel has the exact combination of genre tags that instantly awaken Satan. It makes this game a bit of a difficult sell, since most people see these tags and think of Doki Doki Literature Club. Shame, since this game is better in every conceivable way, but DDLC has several factors that were nearly guaranteed to make it more popular. That's where I come in. I want you to play Echo, and so I've designed this video to be free of spoilers for as long as possible so I can talk about what makes it so great without spoiling any of the routes. After that, I'll talk about each route one by one, and the more specific details about them. Those parts will contain heavy spoilers, and so I pray to god you either play the game before watching those parts, or don't care, which is regrettable, but understandable. So, with formalities out of the way, Echo has become my favorite visual novel and horror game. It's an unparalleled masterpiece of writing and design, and I'm going to explain why. Part 1. Characterization conflict, and the genius of the intro. Echo is a difficult game to talk about, because on top of being one of the most difficult and complicated games to analyze I've ever played, which we'll get to in the discussion of the routes, it's also one of the tightest written games I've ever played. Talking about the characters immediately leads to talking about the plot, which leads to talking about other characters, which leads to talking about a completely different part of the plot that's also a massive spoiler. But switching from bashing my writing abilities to praising the games, a lot of this problem is because each aspect of the story is weaved so tightly together. There's absolutely no wasted space in the prologue. A visual novel needs to introduce the world and characters pretty quickly, because you have at most only a couple of hours to get an idea of what everyone's about before the game wants you to focus on someone in particular. Echo not only does this with half a dozen characters, but each plot is established so well that you get to see glimpses of each plot and you probably won't even notice it on your first playthrough. Some of these introductory moments are pretty obvious, such as the heartfelt conversation with Leo or the Blair Witch-esque scene where Chase looks out over the town and talks about its history. Other moments are more subtle, like where you hug Carl. This is Carl. This is such a small moment, but in the span of like two minutes it shows you that Carl is a stoner, that it's clearly a pretty major part of his life since he's seeing some of the other characters for the first time in years and he's doing so while high, and what he feels like. This is something that didn't strike me as important until it was explained to me, but in furry media, describing how a character feels to touch is often as important as describing their appearance. Think about it. Regular people have regular skin, so unless the writing is calling attention to a skin abnormality like a scar, you can pretty easily imagine what they feel like. But a world populated by fursonas is going to create that need to explain texture. Cuddling the wolf himbo isn't going to feel the same as cuddling the twink links, which won't feel the same as cuddling the scaly, which won't feel the same as cuddling the only character who regularly showers. That got me on a bit of a tangent, but that's exactly what I was getting at earlier. This game isn't just great, it's all woven together like the world's most well-crafted rope, and that rope is tied into a beautiful noose that I used to hang myself with by the end of Leo's route. And speaking of nooses, let's address the elephant in the literature club. One of my primary issues with DDLC is that it's trying to do too many things. A boring visual novel about mental health and a super spooky creepypasta game not only fail on their own merits, but undermine each other in the pursuit of subverting expectations. Mild spoiler, but despite being a psychological horror VN, Echo doesn't do that, and instead chooses to subvert your expectations by exceeding them. It's on a much slower boil than Doki Doki, but the space between a new game and horror is taken up by things like good writing and actual characters, rather than two hours of beige followed by another two hours of beige but with it also doesn't break the fourth wall every 20 minutes for spooky meta moments it remains in its own fiction <laughs> with the ddlc rant out of the way i should probably explain who the characters are since i've already mentioned some of them this is Carl. He's a chill guy who smokes weed and plays video games. This is Jenna. She's a psychology major who's witty, intelligent, and pragmatic. She's also my crush. This is Leo. If you see this man, and you feel something, this game is a no-brainer recommendation. Oh, and he's also the next guy's ex-boyfriend. This is Chase. He's a journalism major, and he's going through a lot right now. This is TJ. He's a good Christian boy who always tries to be kind and upbeat. 
He's also my crush. This is Flynn. He's a bit of a d but uses his insults to show affection for the group. He's also horny as hell. This is the main cast, and while it isn't clear right off the bat, this bundle of flaws, traumas, and dubious smells are some of the best written characters in... ever. They're beautiful. I like every single one of them. They're all likable and complex. I want to kiss T- With all the characters introduced, let's actually talk about the plot and what makes it good in the moment rather than in the context of the rest of the game. Echo opens with three of the six main characters driving back to the titular town. You play as Chase, a journalism major who's returning to Echo to work on a school project about the town's history. His old friend group spins the project into an opportunity for a reunion, and so Chase is bringing two friends with him, TJ and Jenna. Upon getting to the motel, the group meets up with the three friends who still live in Echo, Carl, Flynn, and Leo. Now, I won't be able to go into too much depth about individual characters without getting into spoilers, but that's okay, both because it's early in the game and that depth hasn't been introduced quite yet, and because these are some of the only moments in the game where the characters are all together. They show you a glimpse of how this friend group's dynamic might have worked in the past, and as an introduction to the cast, it paints everyone in a likable, positive manner. All they're talking about is Marvel movies, but it works really well for establishing a tone. Granted, that tone is taken into the caves and shot right off the bat, but that's part of the point. It's a subversion of expectations, but on a narrative level rather than on a meta-narrative level. It's also really good. After an evening of pleasant conversation, it's the next day and the group decides to go to an amusement park in the nearby and much larger town of Peyton. This is where things begin falling apart, but in small ways. For example, the group cohesion of the previous day is fractured, with the six people forming small groups rather than being all together, and some people being slightly annoyed at that. This also allows for characters to have development, such as Flynn bullying TJ a bit too much and not really caring about the consequences, or the competitive streak between Leo and Jenna. As character moments, they're fun, but they also serve as introductions to dynamics that will become far more prominent in certain routes. The scene with Leo and Jenna in particular is really fun. I love Leo's face here. There's also... Alright, let's talk about the gay. As I've stated before, I want you to play Echo. By now though, you've probably noticed that 1, this is a furry game, and 2, this game is gay. You may have only gotten a vague idea based on the ex-boyfriend comment and how 5 of the 6 main characters are guys, but let me tell you now that it's gay. It's super gay. It's every character is gay. Gay. It's, no, seriously, every single character in this town. Like, there is not one single straight person here. Literally every character is gay. Gay. Like, here. You know the bit where Leo and Chase hug and then a car drives by screaming a homophobic slur? They're gay too. Everyone is gay. Now, as a bisexual... I don't mind this. In fact, I like it a lot. But if you're not part of those demographics, this might not be the easiest sell. So let me try to sell it anyway. You don't have to be gay or a furry to enjoy this game. It absolutely helps, but the game has enough going on so that even if the romance and musky boys aren't your deal, there's plenty to like in the story and how it's written. As a friend put it, I don't care about the furry shit, but I respect the art. Also, for those who might be wondering, that bi comment wasn't a joke? I'm bi. This is my coming out video. This is a bit of a non sequitur, but I really love tea. Coffee is great, has a strong flavor I like, but with tea there's more of a subtlety, more mild flavors that you really have to pay attention to in order to properly enjoy. Or you could only drink sweet tea from McDonald's and then hate drinking decent tea because it doesn't have the sickening level of overt sweetness you're used to. On a more relevant note, there are likely going to be people who look at furry media and dismiss it outright on the basis of it being furry media. But even if you're the type of person to look at something with furries and instantly go, FURRY TRASH! One, hello hate watchers, and two, you have to acknowledge that this is at least very well written furry trash. More thought and care was put into how creatures like this would exist in the world than I've seen in a furry game. Sometimes this manifests in small ways, like calling a thermostat a habistat, or the fact that the animal plushies are all mythological creatures because human plushies are weird, or how the animals that are used as meat are never portrayed as sentient characters, which is a smart way to deal with the question of how does meat work in this universe. It's not a perfect answer, but it's leagues better than Zootopia. And sometimes this manifests in larger ways, like with the concept of speciesism. 
I like speciesism a lot. It's a great way to translate prejudice into this game's world as a concept, but the way it's used is nothing short of genius. I think a lot of this has to do with how it isn't allegorical. No one species feels like they're coded to be a certain race. The closest the game gets to a one-to-one -one allegory is with Jenna, the fennec fox who came from a Native American tribe. However, because fennec foxes are the only species with such a close resemblance to real-world groups, it feels like more of a believable outlier than the norm. On top of that, rather than using current and past racial prejudices, different kinds of prejudices are made to fit the animals that are based on their stereotypes. The speciesist comments made about Jenna don't have to do with her being from a Native American tribe. They're about how she's a sly fox who shouldn't be trusted. Stuff like that is what allows Echo to feel less like it's set in our world but with animals, and more like it's set in its own separate world. Oh, and there's a Jesus species debate! People don't know for certain what species Jesus was. There's a genuine theological debate over what fursona Jesus would have. This single throwaway line has absolutely captivated me. Music is another aspect that's absolutely captivated me. Well, actually, that's misleading. Everything about this game has captivated me, but music is what I want to talk about next. Shut up. I'm the ruler here. Now, as I say in every video, I genuinely have no clue whatsoever about how music works. All my commentary about this music has nothing to do with its production and quality, and everything to do with its implementation. But by god, what an implementation! Music consistently sells the mood. I've been using the casual music throughout this video so far, and, at least in my opinion, it's doing a pretty good job at selling a pleasant tone here. Other music is much the same, where it usually takes a back seat in order to complement the scene in writing. To that effect, it does its job really well, making sad scenes gut-wrenching, spooky scenes dread-inducing, and angry scenes sound like pathologic. The only track I really trust myself to talk about more is the title track, but it's also one of the best tracks in the game. It's an amazing combination of pleasant melodies and occasional darker sounding notes. The overall pleasant tone sells the vibe of a cute, fun, furry dating sim, but the more ominous notes hint at the horrors each story has, making the track sound more sinister the longer it goes on. It's a fantastic track that effectively gets the vibe of the game across, to the point where you'll be looking at these characters and saying, Aw, cute, I wonder which of these six I'll romance, but nope! It's actually five, because this one is the main character, and I cannot stress enough that the main character actually lives up to the character part of that title. You see, dear audience, some people think that a visual novel protagonist needs to have as little of a presence as possible in order to make them easier to project onto. This line of thought has two problems. Bitch. Art rules get broken. That's how art works. Experimentation may not end in success, and you may not even like it, but to say it's bad because it's not the normal thing to do is just such a boring way of looking at media. And two, even in terms of tropes, the blank slate protagonist is one of the most overused and limiting ones. I complain about protagonists without character in Call of Duty games, so imagine how much untapped potential there is in games that are about things other than- <laughs> Having Chase be a character isn't just a good idea, it's an obvious good idea. A story in which the main character's narrative purpose is more than being the bloke with a camera lodged in his head typically shouldn't be played by one. Obviously there can be exceptions, but this is set up for later analysis, and I'd rather not get bogged down by um actually comments when we all know I'm painting in strokes so broad I could recolor a six lane highway. Naturally, creating an actual character for your visual novel will have some consequences, primarily that you can't treat them like the brown-haired oblivious otaku schoolboy they usually are. Thankfully, not only were the writers aware of this, but Chase is what ties each narrative together. Having a personal, textured history with each member of the cast makes the interpersonal drama and horror so much more effective, as characters are bouncing the pasts and personalities off of each other, rather than one character bouncing their pasts and personalities off of a brick wall with brown hair in an ordinary life until they had to go to a new school. But it also leads to some interesting horror elements. This is getting a bit into spoiler territory, but the player and the player character are separate, and as a result of that, there's a bit of a disconnect that gets capitalized on like a game that knows how to put the player off kilter without- <laughs> This game does get dark though. Far darker than DDLC, in fact. It's dark to the point where the lead writer had to take a break from writing it to write a completely different visual novel that's also apparently fantastic. Though I haven't played it, and given how many years I've been told to, I really don't know if I will. Oh look! A flashbang!
let's talk about Ad Astra. Ad Astra is a heavily story-based visual novel game. Ad Astra has a plot line that is regarded as getting occasionally dark while leaving you in suspense, hope, and joy. It starts with you, Marco, as a new college student studying abroad in Rome, Italy. On your first night in your dorm room, you get abducted by space aliens. When you get to the large moon of Ad Astra, you learn that they are currently experiencing bureaucracy problems. But not just normal bureaucracy problems. Space bureaucracy problems. Here's something I thoroughly enjoy. The game gives an interesting interpretation of how early human groups formed, like the Romans and the Egyptians and the Greeks and whatnot. The artist Haps does an outstanding job with the stills of each character and is able to show off an amazing amount of personality in each and every character still. And on a final note, the internet fell in love with Himbo Space Wolf because he's a big old lovable oaf. However, I fail to see how the community of, you know, just furries has failed to realize that there is a much better option and he's been here the whole time. As someone who's been trying to get Locke to play this game for over a year, it will happen. Fight me. Oh look, an AC-130. Usually I talk about gameplay in these videos. It's honestly kind of difficult to talk about games in which there's so little gameplay. Echo is doubly difficult, both because all you do is click to read more, and because what choices exist are, say it with me now, some of the best I've ever seen. I wish I could talk about all the choices now, but unfortunately almost every choice is a spoiler, so I'm going to show just one choice that won't spoil anything and explain what makes it great so you can get an idea of how clever the other choices are. Let me paint you some context. At Furry Six Flags, after riding Furry King to Ka, Chase, Carl, and King are all watching some dumb stage shows. Chase is getting pretty tired and decides the best choice is to lean on one of his friends to sleep. You get to choose whether to lean on TJ or lean on Carl. Narratively, this choice is arbitrary. However, the game is using this narratively arbitrary choice to demonstrate how the game does choices, as well as let you know what the characters feel like, which as I stated before, is very important to furry media. Look at your options here. You have a big soft ramboy and a bony ass twink who looks like he's never had a carb in his life. As much as I want to be physically closer to TJ, I must concede that Carl is the better person to lean on. What makes it interesting is that the writers know this too. The game knows and comments on how there's an obviously more correct option, which is not only a clever bit of understanding your characters, but also fairly unconventional in visual novels. This is a way to subtly inform the player that choices are going to be treated differently from most other visual novels, which is something you might not even notice on your first playthrough. Or second playthrough. Or third. Even with the splitting of the routes, perhaps the most common choice trope in the entire genre of visual novels is done like nothing else. But talking about that means talking about the river scene, which is difficult, but that's because it's doing several smart things at once. The river scene involves everyone sitting around the river, which is near the lake. While everyone is hanging around, they start talking about how Chase used to give everyone rides, taking them swimming out into the lake. This makes Flynn really fucking mad, because talking about this so close to the lake is disrespectful to Sydney. But who's Sydney? Sydney is dead. Something that I haven't mentioned until now is that there was another member of the group when everyone was children, that being Sydney. When everyone was around 10, Sydney drowned in the lake. Prior to this scene, there have been occasional references to Sydney being gone, but not explicitly dead until this scene. That's a great reveal on its own, made better by Flynn's enraged delivery of this to the player that makes an uncomfortable scene shocking to boot, made even better by the fact that this reveal doesn't reveal everything. When Flynn is targeting TJ, it's also revealed that TJ was the one witness to Sydney drowning in the lake. Flynn is pretty dead set on the idea that TJ knows something more, which leads to a beautiful moment where every fiber of my being wants to defend my king, but Flynn keeps saying things that are new to me, so I'm torn between being mad at Flynn and being curious about what he has to say. Bringing me to Flynn's rant. Flynn targets every member of the group on a deeply personal level, stacking several reveals on top of each other in a series of pretty shocking accusations. It really adds to the feeling of complete bewilderment the game leaves you with by the end of the scene. So Flynn accuses everyone, Leo beats him up, and Flynn leaves as what just happened sinks in for everyone. Leo is furious, Jenna is worried, Carl is defeated, TJ is sobbing in a bush, and Flynn is gone. And then, then, at this point, the game asks you what route to take. 
This is the greatest game I've ever played. Most visual novels will very unambiguously signal when the routes are about to diverge, and you need to pick the cute girl or cute boy of your choice. This works on a surface level, but doesn't do a whole lot beyond being purely utilitarian. The river scene makes it significantly harder to choose what route you want in a regular visual novel, because the past five minutes have been the most chaotic emotional roller coaster thus far. I can't think about who I want to f I gotta make sure TJ is okay. Lucky for me, TJ was the one I wanted to f but that's beside the point. The prologue sets up everything in the game brilliantly, and the river scene serves as both a complete shock on multiple levels in the moment and further setup for the routes. It's the final piece in the prologue's genius, tying everything seen so far together while introducing new character drama and new mysteries on top of old ones. This game is incredible. You should play it. Seriously, all subsequent parts are going to heavily spoil each route, one after another. If anything I've mentioned here has struck your interest, mechanically, narratively, thematically, or sexually, play this game. I've included a link to the game in the video description. It is free, and I cannot recommend it enough. Now, with that all being said, to those here now, if you've not played the game, I understand. If you have, thank you. To all, sit back and enjoy the show. What's going on? Not my question to answer. What are you talking about? You brought me here for a reason. You can brought here for a reason. It's your job to figure that out. TJ was the first route I did, because TJ was my romantic option of choice already, and my instinct to help him didn't conflict with that. He's also one of my favorite routes, because on top of being my first route when I was an easy sell, this route is brilliantly paced with fantastic character development and theming. It's just a damn good story overall. TJ's route is about spending time with TJ, obviously, but the way that manifests is interesting, because where most dating sims would be a pretty predictable ride from point A to point B, Echo throws you for enough loops to mimic the suicide coaster, and unlike the suicide coaster, it does this well. I think the best way to start is by talking about the romance, because it's a good jumping off point to talk about the other stuff, and it's good on its own merits. Romantic tension is something that's very important to creating an interesting romance story, in the same way regular tension is important to making an interesting adventure, suspense, etc. story. A story in which the main character just has a straight shot to their goal is typically a pretty boring one. Stories thrive on conflict. You might think this is storytelling advice so basic even my Call of Duty obsessed ass would know this, but someone needs to tell this to an awful lot of visual novel writers because the narratives can be shot so straight you'd think you wouldn't be allowed to romance all the cute boys. And while there's nothing inherently wrong with wish fulfillment, the incognito tab is right over there and you don't need to back a Kickstarter to see it. All this dancing around the point and taking pot shots at games my friends like is preamble to me saying that Echo handles romance exceptionally well, and a lot of that is through build-up and tension that enhances other elements of the story, such as character development and horror. And now that I've said that, I'll present an example. During an evening at the local diner, TJ ends up talking to Janice, the diner's waitress and my favorite side character. I know that sounds like blasphemy against every other side character, save one, but I'll get to that. I'll get to it. Now, TJ ends up agreeing to help Janice clean up her backyard, which is full of tumbleweeds and a rotten shed. Chase is pretty upset about this because cleaning a backyard kind of sucks, and TJ almost immediately buckled under pressure. This has the pretty clear narrative purpose of getting Chase and TJ away from the others, but it also demonstrates a flaw in TJ's character, that being how he desires to be helpful and supportive to everyone to a fault. I love this character flaw because I relate to it a lot, but more prevalently, it's a core part of his character. The fact that TJ wants to be helpful even to his own personal detriment isn't something that he's going to fix in the course of a week. It's part of who he is, and it can't be changed that easily, and it isn't. This is the fatal flaw in a lot of visual novels. Romantic tension isn't there, and so to create conflict, something will be introduced that just gets solved for the best ending. In this one scene, character flaws are being woven together with the romance, putting you with the cute boy in an unpleasant situation you wouldn't be in if not for said cute boy. And then you get to cleaning and it's not particularly exciting because it's moving tumbleweeds, oh boy, but it's made better by TJ as a result of his personality on top of the player's implicit desire for the character. TJ and Chase take their shirts off because they're hot and it's hot, but TJ is also an upbeat person who wants to make people happy, and he succeeds at that. 
he's able to make clearing out a backyard for digging a grave into something that's as pleasant as it is disturbing. For those of you who haven't played Echo and are still watching, I mention that specifically to throw you for a curveball and intrigue you, and I won't even explain it because it's irrelevant to the rest of the story. I will talk about Janice, though. I really like Janice. She has an energy that's always really positive, but spending any length of time with her begins to reveal that something is catastrophically wrong with her. The casual speciesism is pretty believable for a small town dweller, but her overall demeanor is a little too chipper, like that woman from Meet the Robinsons who used two dozen caffeine patches or Yuri on the second playthrough. The more time you spend with her in TJ's route, the more it looks like she's plotting a murder, which is creepy as all hell, but it's never explained further. You never learn her motivation, her intended victim, or even even if she went through with it and killed someone. Hell, even in another route where she does kill someone, you never learn who. The entire thing is shrouded in mystery, which latched onto my mind like the hat from Meet the Robinsons, or the one good scene with Yuri in the second playthrough. Janice is great. Unlike other side characters, which are great on their own and have compelling stories, Janice has a compelling mystery behind her, which makes her a fantastic addition to the world. Anyway, TJ is hot and I want him, but the game keeps taking him from my grasp, and if that sounds like a narrative flaw, you need to close that incognito tab and get on the game's level. Echo being on a slow boil persists here, both in romance and in horror. The romantic buildup is slow for a visual novel, with scenes of romantic tension being very small things that maybe only Chase notices. Admiring him shirtless, watching him get flustered after unintentionally possibly saying he finds you cute, going on a hiking trip in which you bond and have an option to FUCKING KILL him but only imagine his rotting corpse if you did that because this game just casually implements the concept of intrusive thoughts here into the gameplay. The horror is also on a slow boil. <laughs> The horror is also on a slow boil, but in a different way. The narrative is pretty non-horror at first, but horror moments begin worming their way into the sidelines and eventually the narrative itself. This is evident in the prologue with a couple mildly spooky dream sequences, but as TJ's route goes on, the dream sequences become more and more frequent and start becoming waking nightmares. These moments are frightening as hell on their own, but what makes them work is their brevity. There are only a few nightmare moments in the route, and each one is relatively short, so they're spaced apart in just the right way where, just as you're getting comfortable with a nice moment with the cast, you get hit with the image of your own face melting off in a diner bathroom. Then everything goes back to normal, and you're allowed to fully get back into the more pleasant atmosphere. But the distrust in the idea that things will stay that way continues growing. It's effective horror that's phenomenally well used. The turning point for this horror-romance dichotomy is Carl's birthday party, as it's where the spooky elements stop being limited to the main character's head and start affecting the world more directly. For context, Carl's birthday isn't for another month, but everyone is here now, so Leo thought it would be fun to throw him a party. So, you go to his house, and on the way run into Janice either high on meth or having a mental breakdown, which is never explained because Janice is mysterious and answering every mystery would be dumb, and Carl doesn't answer the door. In fact, he's not here at all. Jenna has to trespass to get the front door unlocked. Carl being gone is obviously a bit of a mood killer, but if we're being honest with ourselves, the party wasn't going to be very much fun anyway. Carl being gone is obviously very worrying though, especially since he's the character who's least likely to leave the house, so everyone splits up and looks for him. This scene is brilliant, especially in the context of the other routes, but because I don't have any other points of reference yet, I won't get into that part right now. On its own, this scene establishes each subsequent part of the narrative, which you might not even notice because in the moment, the writing is so compelling and unsettling. While you're looking around, you overhear an argument between TJ and Flynn. Flynn still doesn't trust TJ's story about Sydney. Sydney. <laughs> Flynn still doesn't trust TJ's story about Sydney's death, because of course he doesn't. He hasn't believed it for 10 years, and unless Leo's right hook erases memories, that won't change. I love this conflict because of how naturally it's set up, and I cannot wait to discuss what makes it so good. But I can't yet, because it makes more sense to talk about the other plot point this scene creates, which I also love. This game is so good, it's unreal! Carl reappears after a while, found in the crawl space under his house for a reason that's an obvious lie, holding an envelope. The envelope contains a scavenger hunt. A scavenger hunt that was designed by Sydney. Not only is this a great plot thread and a big balls move to introduce a concrete narrative this late in the game, but because so many horror elements have been thrown into the narrative over time, it literally had me questioning whether it would come up again. But it does come up again. In fact, it's the new plot of the game. The group talks about it and decides to try and do the scavenger hunt as a way of getting closure, except Flynn, because Flynn's idea of getting closure is meeting with TJ alone and getting answers. The first piece of the scavenger hunt is in a birdhouse in the woods, and right off the bat, something is up. 
TJ insists on going through the scavenger hunt right away, even though it's night out, the notes are still in their places ten years down the line, the notes are weirdly targeted at Chase, and more importantly, the notes are somehow still there ten years down the line, unscathed. Note 2 is in an abandoned school, and Note 3 is in a house someone is currently living in, and TJ somehow knows all of this, taking an uncharacteristically deadpan expression and tone every time he says he knows where the next piece is. It's creepy and mysterious, and because none of it is explained, I've been thinking about it constantly. It feels like so many stories are trying so hard to explain themselves, how their worlds work. It can be kind of a shock to remember how powerful not explaining things can be, especially for a suspenseful story like this. The scavenger hunt is a small part of the game, but it stands out to me as one of the straightforwardly best parts. There's so much complicated stuff going on in Echo, either in the layers of writing or how it affected me personally, that I've come to really appreciate a bit of storytelling that impacts me just by being really, really engaging. But if you want to see me talk uncritically about unserious things, go watch my other videos. But only some of them. The rest are bad. The notes themselves are another big part of the mystery, because not only are they more and more directly addressed to Chase, but they also seem to imply Sidney knows the future. Later messages begin to hint at Sidney knowing he died, and furthermore hinting that Chase killed him. Chase thinks this is a load of shit Flynn is making up to hurt TJ, and no way is that going to happen when Chase is hell-bent on protecting slash making love to TJ. A relatable goal, but as we'll soon address, Chase has one or two or insert number so large science has yet to discover it problems. This leads to one of the most heartbreaking scenes in the route. With only one note left to find, Chase sneaks out of the motel to go where he knows the note will be. He then digs it up and replaces the note with his own. Everyone knows this can only end horribly. I know it, you know it, the people in the other room haven't been watching the video and even they know it. It's a naked display of self-destruction matched only by the fallout of this action. It ends horribly. I knew it, you knew it, Jack Saint knew it, my friends who haven't played this game knew it. It's incredible to read though, but more convenient to the structure of this video, it gets the side characters out of the way and allows me to focus on character analysis. And with plot stuff out of the way for the most part, I'm going to pivot to talking about just that. A lot of the stuff I've already mentioned is good, a lot better than good honestly, but what really completes it is TJ, Chase, and their respective arcs. TJ's route is about losing control, and Chase exemplifies that in ways that can only be done with a main character who is separate from the player. Throughout the prologue, there are a lot of moments that give the impression that Chase is a blank slate for audience projection. This is even what Flynn says to him at the river, you have the personality of a fucking rock. However, there are also moments that show there's more under the surface. He's had a relationship with Leo in the past, and actively comments on how he used to be more interesting and got more milk toast with time. He's still fairly generic by the start of a route, but that ultimately serves the impression that Chase is a mildly interesting character who has the same goals and motivation as the player, because at the start, the player and the player character seem to be the same entity. That being said, they aren't. I mentioned before that Chase isn't written entirely as an audience surrogate, and the separation between you and Chase grows as the narrative progresses, which mirrors Chase's own separation within himself. Chase has a voice in his head, which starts off only having a minor effect with individual lines that scare the shit out of me, but as the route goes on, it appears more and more. This is how the horror part of the narrative grows to overtake the romance part of the narrative, but it also serves as Chase's character development and the subversion of expectations because main character development doesn't usually happen. As the voice continues to grow more prominent, Chase goes from confused about its existence, to repeating what it says, to agreeing with the way it thinks which is where things get really interesting. Towards the end of the week, Chase and TJ run into Julian, one of TJ's friends from school. Julian is a little boring, but overall he's a pretty nice guy, and I think a lot of players won't really have a problem with him existing in the narrative beyond the fact that he doesn't have a lot of depth in and of himself. Chase, however, fucking hates Julian. The fact that TJ is hanging out with Julian and not paying attention to him is destroying him inside, which a player who wants to see a romantic payoff will be able to sympathize with and also be horrified by, because Chase's desire to get Julian out of the picture is mildly disturbing. The aggression in Chase's narration keeps building until every line starts making me feel pain because you know this is all going to boil over and it's going to be really ugly, and I also personally relate to it a lot because I'm not a good person. Person. This culminates in a confession scene that's absolute agony to watch. I still want to see these two get together, but by this point I'm genuinely worried about Chase's grip on reality. 
Like, oh my god, Julian is teaching TJ how to play skee-ball, and Chase acts like he's being cheated on right now, to his face, and if it goes on for another second, he'll get his Glock from home. And that's part of what makes this scene so effective. It's the exact sort of payoff to the last few hours of story. And while the fact that this is where the story ended up is subversion enough, it is so tightly written on so many levels. There's such a conflict of emotions, and you can even see that in the art. Good lord, this is my favorite screen in the game. It captures the scene so well. And I haven't even talked about the gay yet. Having been gay for like 30 minutes, I'm not the best at analyzing work through a queer lens. In fact, I'm terrible at it. I watched Luca and was like, whoa, I think this is about gay. And that's all the experience I have. So my queer analysis has been accomplished with a bit, a lot of help. I hope I'm doing a good job. You're doing fantastic, kitty. Go get him. You got, you, you got this. You got this down. The relationship between Chase and TJ, in particular the romance, does not work without the fact that it's gay, because it has several thematic ties to the trope of the innocent Christian boy being possessed by an evil gay man. Romantic scenes have an ambiguity to them, where to Chase they seem like a romantic moment, but to TJ they seem like nothing. This is a great bit of really subtle foreshadowing that things are going to go wrong, but the notion of the dangerous homosexual seeing signs where there aren't any is literally the plot of Boys Beware. You see, Jimmy hadn't recognized Ralph's approach soon enough. When Ralph first asked Jimmy to go fishing alone, he should have discussed it with his parents or teacher. No matter where you meet a stranger, be careful if they are too friendly, if they try to win your confidence too quickly, and if they become overly personal. One never knows when the homosexual is about. Public restrooms can often be a hangout for the homosexual. Perhaps what made this image so painful to me wasn't just the romantic tragedy, but the homophobic undertones in the imagery and framing of it. And that's a good thing for the record. All this subtext is super uncomfortable, but this is meant to be a psychological horror game that actually affects you on a psychological level and doesn't just make the big titty anime girl stab herself. This isn't wish fulfillment. Go back to the incognito window. On the subject of the innocent Christian boy, he's my favorite, and I want him. God, just look at him, he's so cute, I want to bury my face in his fluffy chest, but there's a lot more going on with him under the surface. While I appreciate him as a cute boy I'm extremely attracted to, the fact that he's so commonly perceived that way by others is a lot of what ends up being detrimental to his psyche. Other people see him as uwu small bean, and this leads to the, to put it lightly, tumultuous web of relationships TJ has with the rest of the cast. Jenna is overprotective of him because of this image. Flynn is overaggressive towards him because he doesn't trust in the image. Chase, and arguably the player, fall for him on the basis of this false perception. Everyone seeing him like this is what leads to his character development and allows for the subversion of expectations caused by his dramatic shifts. It also doubles as further subversion when the game ends and TJ's agency is undercut with a sword the size of a skyscraper. That's okay though, because so is Chase's, and I was too busy losing my goddamn mind over the ending to notice. But I'm jumping the gun a little. Before the climax of the narrative, Chase spends one or two or several hours locked in the bathroom with the scary voices. At this point, Flynn is going to talk to TJ one-on-one, -on -one, and in Chase's mind, that will entail doing horrible things to my king and revealing the secret. What's interesting though is that this is a different entity from the one that's been speaking to Chase throughout the game. This voice has a different font, and if I've learned anything from game <laughs> that means it's a different character. But who? I'm not exactly sure, but after spending several hours talking to my own mirror image, I have some speculations. One reading is that this voice is the manifestation of a force greater than anything seen in the game, something like the entity we'll later discuss in Carl's Route, or some malevolent force tied to the town. The evidence for this is supported by several lines in the text, such as references to the mass hysteria and prevention of it, which neither I nor an audience member who hasn't played the game will understand yet, and the repeated line, this town needs secrets. These are all lines that, in the bigger picture that is the rest of the routes, seem to imply this entity plays a larger role in the history of the town, and might even be the manifestation of the hostile energy that surrounds Echo. However, while this does explain the voice on a narrative level, to go with the reading you have to ignore the themian characterizing of the scene, which is unquestionably there, and a lot more interesting to talk about. If you look at the scene with the voice through what it's doing with themes, imagery, and character, then it reads as a dialogue that represents Chase's internal conflict, and the voice is a visualization of how Chase is falling further and further into a more dangerous, self-destructive persona. 
The imagery is a callback to a previous scene in which Chase hallucinates his face melting in a diner bathroom, which is both incredibly unsettling and cements said imagery as a metaphor for Chase falling apart. This is complemented by several lines that give distorted Chase a character that is, appropriately, a distortion of Chase's mental state. Mirror Chase acts as a culmination of the feelings that have been growing inside Chase over the route. He's critical of Chase's ignorance, paranoid of the others, especially Flynn, and demands the protection of the secret. These are the unfiltered versions of Chase's critical perception of himself, others, and TJ respectively. The third comparison might not make sense, but since TJ and The Secret are both perceived as fragile and in need of protection, they serve a similar purpose thematically. For a final layer of thematic depth, this scene can also serve as a microcosm of Chase's character progression throughout the route. He starts off unaware of Shadow Chase, and begins to fall for his influence as the route goes on, which in the scene is expressed as Chase asking his mirror self advising questions. And by the end, he ends up agreeing with this darker influence, as both the scene and the route end with Chase agreeing with him to the point where Chase becomes an extension of Mirror Chase's will. This reading has the advantage of being more thematically interesting, having a greater level of depth, and falling in line with the motif of a character's possession being affected by the nature of their flaws, but it does still leave you with This Town Needs Secrets and the other lines that don't really fit that interpretation. So how do you look at these two possible interpretations? Personally, I'd choose door number two with no hesitation, because thematically it has a lot more going for it, and I find it far more interesting to actually look underwater than to sit in a paste boat and point out how patches of water on the surface are similar shades of blue to other patches of water. But I admit, that particular reading still has its shortcomings. Solution? Cut through mid and pray Flynn isn't camping with his lever action, and that no one else is camping with a better gun. My initial thought was that you could combine the two theories. Chase's internal monologue chooses to manifest itself as a cosmic horror, or a cosmic horror is playing to Chase's internal conflict for its own needs. These are technically possible, but they both suck. If Chase's monologue is acting as a cosmic horror, that would raise the question of why? And also how? But if the cosmic horror is playing to Chase's insecurities, then that almost completely undercuts all the thematic value the scene had. So yeah. So much for pushing mid. But hey, not every mystery needs to be solved in order to enjoy a piece of media. And honestly, I kind of like how it implies Chase knows way more subconsciously than he's willing to admit, even when he's already in denial about what he subconsciously knows. And with that all out of the way, we're brought to the final scene. Everyone on the shore of the lake where Sydney died. TJ is being confronted by Flynn, and Flynn is now being confronted by Chase. This scene is incredible. No amount of analysis I could write will do this climax justice. The imagery, music, and raw emotion are incredibly powerful, but I'm going to try. The secret is that Chase murdered Sydney. I was suspecting this leading up to the reveal, but that's okay because a good reveal that is narratively satisfying doesn't lose that if you can figure out what that reveal is. Shade throwing at shows I haven't seen aside, the reveal itself is so good that even if knowing the reveal ahead of time could ruin it, it wouldn't make a dent in the quality of how the secret gets out. When Chase goes out and does the don't dig up the Super Wolf lunchbox at 3am challenge, he keeps the note he replaces with his own and doesn't look at the note he takes. This note is kept in the story's pocket until this moment, where Chase confronts Flynn and gives him the note. This note, understandably, shocks and enrages Flynn, because it's a drawing of Chase drowning Sydney in the lake. This subverts the audience's expectation by making Chase responsible for the secret getting out, and subverts it further by obliterating any confidence in the notion that Flynn was behind the scavenger hunt. It also seemingly obliterates the notion of Sydney making the scavenger hunt, but like I said before, that's not a mystery I feel compelled to solve. What is compelling is the fight that takes place immediately after, where Chase is egged on by himself to go further and further to protect TJ to the point where he literally murders Flynn. Flynn's death is viscerally heartbreaking in ways that I don't think I've ever seen a game pull off so successfully. Having seen Chase's mental deterioration throughout the events of the plot, the audience begins to relate to him less and less, and by this final scene you're watching the protagonist slowly kill his childhood friend over perceived threats neither you nor the character have actually seen, and you find yourself sympathizing far more with the supposed villain of the route than the monster your audience surrogate has become. The writing as well helps sell things tremendously well. This murder and the effect it has on Flynn, both physically and emotionally, is described in excruciating detail. It's agonizing to read through, knowing that every new line will add another awful detail. The story uses Flynn's eyes in particular, watching them go from rage to panic to desperate pleading as the light fades from them. It's the kind of scene that can really shake a person to their core, and I love it for that. 
If you get past the emotional turmoil of the scene, you monster, you'll find the game is tapping into one of its most prominent pieces of symbolism, circles. The imagery of circles is present from the moment you click New Game. Just like this town, you're always moving in circles. Each route uses this symbolism in some way to strengthen the game, and in TJ's route, that symbolism is used in murder. The motivation and method involved in Chase's killing of Flynn are the same as they were when Chase killed Sydney a decade prior. Someone was being mean to TJ, Chase's protect TJ at all cost instinct kicks in, and someone goes underwater for a little too long. It's the same story being told again, and after it happens, Chase and TJ have a moment to let this sink in. They aren't together, but they have a codependent bond so toxic it should have an exclusion zone around it. The game closes with the pair leaving the town, their secret safe. It's optimistic and awful for the characters, and dramatically bleak for the player. My jaw was on the floor when the credits rolled. This route is incredible. It's so beautifully written on so many levels that even after writing all this, several pages of gushing about how well written everything is, I don't know if I've truly done it justice. I don't know if I could ever truly do it justice. It's a masterpiece. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, what are the other routes like? Or, how are we nearly an hour in after only one route? To answer both of those questions, oh boy, you'll see. I told you, I don't know. You can't just knock me out, send me to the beach, and then tell me I have to figure out why I'm here. I told you, you've been brought here for a reason. What difference does that make? Think about it. You cast into it. All right, so me knowing the reason is what allows me to leave. Good. And you're here to keep me from leaving. Go on. And so, if you tell me what's going on, we can get out of here. Jesus Christ, no! So, I'm guessing a few of you still haven't played Echo, and I understand that, but really, play Echo. I've spoiled one route, but there's four others I haven't gotten to, and they are all as good, if not better, than TJ's. Keep watching if you want, though, please, because this route still remains effective even when you know what's going to happen. Romeo and Juliet opens with someone spoiling the ending, and people still love that. They even love the weird present-day one. That's me. I love the weird present day one. Carl's route is a substantial deviation from the other routes, both because all of the routes are pretty drastically different, and because this one in particular has a shift in tone that makes it more reminiscent of a campy gay horror film than soul-crushing, life-changing existential crisis game. Unfortunately, this route makes some missteps that cause it to be one of the weaker routes, but a weak route in Echo is leagues better than the vast majority of game narratives. To start, let's look at the shift in tone. It's lighter, but still in line with the rest of the game. The way it does this is mainly through how the horror manifests. A spooky ghost locking up everyone in the least fun escape room and blatantly possessing people is a lot more camp than the horror of the other routes, but the writing retains its intelligence in world building and character development. This allows the tone of the horror to shift while still fitting in with the rest of the game. The object of the horror may change, but the way it gets treated remains consistent. Character writing also remains consistent, in that it's better than virtually every other story I've ever read. The way Carl is introduced is arguably the best of any character in the entire game, since his character instantly jumps the hurdle of stoner stereotype by being more textured and interesting, and on top of that, the first scene with him is a detailed description of said texture. He's like a big soft beanbag chair. I may like twinks, but I can see the appeal. Carl is a remarkably realistic portrayal of a person who's lost. He knows playing video games and smoking weed aren't getting him anywhere, but he doesn't know how to break out of that current cycle, or if he ever will, and that terrifies him. It's the old trope of being stuck in a small town, brought to a contemporary time by combining it with the trope of the lazy fat kid who smokes pot and plays video games all day. This modernizes the former while humanizing the latter, and the writing that accompanies these tropes paints the most believable and instinctively relatable character for me in the entire game. All of the characters have traits, details, and quirks that make them more human, ironically, and relatable. For the record, aspects of each of these characters hit me on a very personal level. I know people who are similar to TJ, or Jenna. I know people who are exactly like Carl. 
Obviously, that's not going to be the case for everyone, and spoiler alert, there are several other moments that affected me more, but I need to talk about the scene where you stay at his house overnight because I reacted to it like a real person spoke to me, entirely as a result of good characterization. For context, Chase is staying the night at Carl's place because Carl was sort of insistent he stayed because he thinks the house is haunted and he's mentally trying to work through some stuff. He talks about how his situation has made him feel worse and worse, like he's locked in a cycle and knows it, but doesn't know how to fix it, and he presents you with this question. Do I have a problem? And shit, that was a difficult question for me to answer. My instinct was, as it usually is for me, to comfort, to say it's fine, but it felt harder than that. On some level it really is fine if Carl continues making art, playing games, and nerding out over superheroes, but I get his desire to do more than what he's doing now. What's making him happy in the short term is contributing to his mental problems worsening in the long term. I wanted to say it's fine, but I didn't want it's fine to mean complacency. You can accept that where you are isn't horrible while still doing more. I didn't know what would help most. I ended up picking you have a problem, which felt strangely out of character for me, but it also felt like what he probably needed to hear. And thank God, Chase was as kind and empathetic as I would have tried to be in his shoes. While it was still clear he was a little out of his depth, because this is the best written game ever, and it made me relate to him even more. And then you wake up, and it's freaky as hell. And then you wake up for real, and it's Wednesday, meaning all the characters are at Carl's front door to throw him a surprise party. And I know that this is adding another route for more context like I mentioned I was wanting to do earlier, but this route is different, so I can't do that analysis quite yet. Give me some time, we're getting there. And I'm sorry for starting so many sentences with and. What makes this scene different from the way it's used in the other routes is pretty obvious. You're with Carl when it happens, which allows for some really interesting imagery to take shape. Carl really doesn't want the party to happen. If it wasn't a surprise party, he would have prevented it from happening entirely. To him, all the friends at his door are bringing him a great deal of stress, even as he knows they don't mean any harm. First of all, this is fantastic character development. It's a brilliant narrative situation to flesh out how Carl's anxiety manifests itself, and I really appreciate how his struggle with it is handled in the mature and serious way that the subject matter deserves. Secondly, the reversal of where you are in this scene brings some really interesting imagery to light. In every other surprise party scene, Carl doesn't answer and you end up having to break into his house. But in this route, you're in the house watching from Carl's perspective. Viewing the scene this way makes the gesture seem like less of a reaching out and more of an invasion of Carl's space, both physically and mentally, even if there's no break-in for this particular route. The party itself leads to drama as well. Carl really just wants to avoid being the center of attention, but Jenna really just doesn't care. Their argument is tense and one-sided, with Carl trying as hard as possible to end the conversation while Jenna berates him. This makes me very uncomfortable, but character-wise serves to foreshadow the dynamic that plays out once the game gets spooky, as well as hinting at the character motivations that tie into the horror. Oh, and there's also a character who appears near his house, but Leo beats him up and he leaves. I'm not going to get to it now, but this is foreshadowing for other routes. The following day, there is no day! <laughs> Editing room update note. Despite the length of this video, there are a lot of things I missed in the game. It happens. My reading isn't going to be all-encompassing. However, I actually missed an entire day in the script, and it would be incompetent of me to not mention what happens at least a little. Carl goes to a job interview, and it goes horribly. This serves to reinforce his idea that he's stuck where he is, with yet another opportunity lost due to his perceived incompetence. Then everyone goes to the lake, which both reinforces the supernatural horror to the audience and kind of resolves the lake plot. Everybody's arguing is stopped by Chase just jumping into the lake, coming to terms with the problem by just jumping in with no hesitation. It's a powerful scene, especially when the others follow his lead. They don't learn the truth, but they heal. It's a good way to resolve this part of the story while not making it the focus. Then Chase gets paralysis while underwater and nearly drowns. Okay, back to where we left off. Chase wakes up in an attic and crawls his way to a hole in the ceiling, falls through, and immediately f***s up his ankle. Welcome to the Escape Room, home of smoke monsters, lore dumps, and so much thematic imagery I'm going to choke on the massive stack of pages I'm writing about it. Our contestants are Chase, Carl, Jenna, and... Oh, god damn it! who let him in? Get the brick cannon out here. 
When the main characters run into Raven, they're all on a hot topic, and they catch up over some food before leaving. This is plenty for him. He's a side character, and the way he's written reinforces that role. In the context of this scene, I actually think this is a great choice. Raven is very much the guy you meet up with, talk for a bit, and know nothing about after. He's only around long enough to get a glimpse of who he is, and that's okay. For the one scene. But then he becomes one of the four characters in the escape room. This doesn't work for a variety of reasons, but I get why Raven is here. He's here so I can have one element I'm allowed to bash relentlessly. He's here because the actions of the plot are written with four people in mind. When Carl and Jenna start getting into fights, someone needs to deal with Jenna while Chase deals with Carl. When the smoke monster begins suffocating someone, it can't be Carl or Jenna because each might let the other die if given the chance. In situations like these, someone needs to be there, and that someone is Raven. However, while Raven may be physically useful to the plot, his actual character serves no purpose whatsoever. You'll be reading through a scene of suspense and intrigue, learning more about the world and watching the narrative unfold, and then Raven just stands there like... Hey. He adds nothing except for he's physically needed to be there, and he adds even less due to his character. His personality never really goes beyond the way he acts in that first scene, which makes him the flattest character by a long shot. The most interesting thing about him is that he has an accent, and not knowing where he was from, I interpreted that to be cartoonish Australian. Yeah, especially after a giant smoke monster chased us around the dining room! That's not a fucking Australian accent, mate. What the hell is wrong with me? This is doubly unpleasant when every character has so much depth, and Raven over here has nothing. No thematic value to the plot, none with his character, nothing even in relation to the others. He's a straight man, and a boring straight man at that. I understand it would have been extremely difficult to write this story with only three people, but it hurts to have three interesting characters with depth and intrigue, and then player four. It's a shame. It's sad. This is so sad. Putting him aside, let's get back to the escape room and how it affects the characters that actually matter. Carl is going through a lot in this route. His week starts with more social interaction than he's had in months, which slightly overwhelms him, and then it's followed by, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, and he's being possessed. I feel like I haven't really mentioned that, so let's get that out of the way now. Carl's being possessed by the ghost of his ancestor, James. Jenna is also being possessed by a different ghost, named John. Raven currently is a ghost and is not being possessed by anyone. Carl's possession ends up forming the backbone of the route, as the ghost he's possessed by has a great deal of plot significance and the way it affects Carl personally is essentially his character arc. James is, to a certain extent, everything Carl wants to be. James is confident, charismatic, and intelligent, which are all traits that Carl doesn't perceive in himself. And at first, following in James's footsteps has tangible benefits for Carl and the group. Carl is more confident, he takes on a more assertive charisma, and by listening to James he's able to learn more of the context of why everyone is there, and what steps to take in order to get out. James, and by proxy Carl, seem to be the only ones who know what's going on. However, problems begin to occur right off the bat. Jenna is also being possessed by a ghost, and the ghost possessing her f***ing hates Carl's ghost. This leads to repeated confrontations that get more violent over time, to the point where Chase and Player 4 have to constantly separate them. And on an internal level, Carl is terrified of what's happening to him. He's becoming the sort of person he wishes he was, but in the process, he's literally becoming a different person. That's scary stuff, no matter how many positives there may be. This is where a lot of the horror comes from, as Carl going through his transformation is really creepy to watch. There are more obvious examples, such as the sheet scene, which I'll get to, but there's subtle moments in the dialogue that add to the effect. It starts getting really hard to discern what lines are being spoken specifically by Carl and what lines are spoken by James, but over time you get the feeling that the former is speaking less. It's really clever and well-written and interesting and- Talk about the sheet scene! I will now talk about the sheet scene! The sheet scene is brilliant, and also one scene in particular that could only work in a visual novel. Chase wakes up and Carl is under a sheet, and it's unclear whether it's really Carl or James, which is already cool because it's a visual representation of the transformation Carl is undergoing mentally. Plus it looks cool. I haven't talked about it before, but the art looks really good in this game, and this image in particular is one of my favorites. So is this one. So is this one. And this one. God, I love the art in this game so much. Then he starts doing the Jacob's Ladder thing, which is f***ing terrifying. Then Chase slowly reaches over, grabbing the sheet and ripping it away to reveal... It's Carl.
Now, if this was a newfangled moving image, you would have the added bonus of watching Carl do the Jacob's Ladder thing, but then Chase would just take the sheet off and it would be Carl. It'd be a very standard reveal. Instead, this is a newfangled picture book. And instead of being a normal reveal, they use the visual novel equivalent of a jump cut. This is genuinely, 100%, literally, one of the best storytelling techniques in a visual novel. I really like when a medium of any kind starts doing stuff that only that medium could do. And for visual novels, these sorts of narrative visual jump cuts are that stuff. And before anyone says something, yes, Doki Doki Literature Club did something like this to reveal Sayori's death, and it was a cool storytelling device there too. Just a shame everything else about that moment dragged it down from good to wherever I left Raven. Also, this part was written before Doki Doki- So now we're going to choose whether Carl's soul gets consumed by a demon or not. This is the turning point of the narrative, where you choose whether Carl makes an effort to resist James's influence or allows James to continue guiding Carl through guiding everyone. I chose the bad ending because, because I'm not a good person, and I thought from a more utilitarian standpoint that James could help until the situation was resolved, after which Carl could rid himself of his influence entirely. This choice was wrong and stupid of me, and I'm so sorry. Personal flaws aside, this choice has a lot of thematic parallels with the earlier choice of whether Carl has a problem or not. He has a personal issue with himself, and you have to determine if his problem should be head-on addressed or if it's fine. But the stakes have been raised for the characters and plot, and in contrasting directions. Where the initial choice was very focused on the character of Carl, you're now getting a choice between whether Carl is more important as a character, or James is more important as a plot device. Wow, that really makes me sound like an asshole for choosing the bad ending first. I'm so sorry. While this is happening, Jenna is also going through her own possession arc. Unlike Carl, this possession arc doesn't have quite as much going on, but its use suits the narrative quite well. Jenna's possession isn't strongly tied to an arc, but it acts as an extension of her thoughts on Carl. For example, Jenna's approach to mental health is very focused on advocating for the self. You can't depend on others for improving yourself. This leads to her being upset with Carl for leaving the party, as his response to the stressor is to leave entirely instead of confronting it. In the spooky zone, the zone of spooks, John is extremely hostile towards James because he's, well, extremely suspicious. And even though John is the more violent one, James is a snaky manipulative charlatan. The conflict of this part of the game is routed in... God damn it. The conflict of this part of the game is rooted in these two leads, but also acts as the way the two ghosts fight. It's a multi-layered conflict, and it's really interesting to watch. You simultaneously have an interesting character conflict, a lore-filled ghost conflict, and horror that comes from not being certain which is happening at any given point. Meanwhile, Chase is the straight man in a way that, unlike Raven, actually matters. He has a not-at-all straight relationship with Carl, and acts as an emotional intermediary between Carl and Jenna. It puts him, and therefore the audience, in the middle of things, which is good because there's a lot of lore revealed on top of the multi-layered conflict. A conflict that, by the way, is symbolized by Chase's foot injury when he falls out of the attic. As this conflict and possessions get worse and worse, Chase's ankle becomes worse as well. The possessions of the characters hinder them mentally, just as Chase's ankle injury hinders him physically. Christ, I'm at seven pages for this section. I'm going to try to summarize the lore fast because I didn't want this part to be so long. So, centuries ago when the town of Echo was small and getting colonized, John and James had an affair. That's right, even the natives and Manifest Destiny colonizers are gay. EVERYONE IS GAY! But their relationship has a bit of a problem when native children start going missing, then James flees for the west coast, then John is accused of the disappearances and is hanged, which really puts a relationship in jeopardy. You know how it is. You fall for someone and they die. Meanwhile, there's a growing pile of children's corpses surrounding you both. We've all been there. Their ghosts are still fighting, though. And now, several hundred years later, some excellent cute furries and this sparkle dog looking motherfucker show up and present each ghost with a means to their end. John wanting to reveal the truth and James wanting to bury it. If that line didn't give it away, let me give it away now. James is the real killer, not John. Well, no sh Loki, the colonizer is behind the murders of Native Americans. I bet next you'll tell me about how interesting Pathologic is, or how his Dark Materials kicks more ass than Harry Potter ever could. And, okay, yeah, but for the record, I've only played 98 minutes of Pathologic 2. James isn't immediately obvious as a threat, because he's being useful, if a bit unsettling. Meanwhile, John is trying to murder Carl. James may be a pretty obvious twist villain, you could probably guess that way earlier, but the how and why of it is revealed slowly. 
James appears at first to be a mysterious benefactor, but he's ultimately seeking to live on through his grandchild, bury his crimes, and literally murder anyone who stands in his way. Wow, Loki, that has some real-world parallels. Mm-hmm. Wow, Loki, that stuff makes you sound way worse for picking the badness. There's another layer to the ghost narrative, but it's considerably more abstract. Forgive me if my reading of this part isn't as clear as most others. There's a scene after everyone investigates an old town, an apparition of Hanged James, and also a knife fight where John and James talk to each other normally, without anything else getting in the way, except for who says what lines. The two ghosts are also aware that Chase is watching, and talk about a mysterious IT who's pulling all the strings. This is the entity I mentioned earlier, by the way. This particular element confuses me, but in a what-does-this-mean way instead of a why-was-this-added way. All we know about this entity is that it's powerful beyond words and that it seems to be toying with everyone. Why does it create these places, let us do small things, then take it away? It's a game. My life, my reputation is a game to it. Here are my three theories. Here are my three readings, which I'm doing quickly because I want to keep this part under 10 pages. One. This entity is a metaphor for the player, and them toying with the characters is symbolic of you playing the game and doing different routes. This kind of makes sense if you look at save states as toying with the lives of the cast, but you as a player also don't have the agency to hear this conversation because you want to. Not to mention it's very uncharacteristic of the game to be so blatantly meta. Not a great reading. 2. The entity is a metaphor for Howley, one of the game's writers. This explains the everything is a game to it line, the chase is listening because it wants him to line, and the cosmic power, because writers of a story are the true gods of that story's world. If Naomi Watts steals the shotgun, the author can just- 3. The entity should be taken literally, as an overwhelmingly powerful cosmic being who's capable of manipulating the world on an untold scale. Because this game has several elements that I feel don't need to be explained, I'm more than happy to accept this as another one of those elements. But I also really want it to be Howley. The endings to Carl's route are incredible. They both resolve themes of the story in fantastic and satisfying ways, and in different ways depending on which ending you choose. Even the bad ending, the visual novel version of a game over, has weight and depth. I want to say it's more interesting than the good ending in some ways, but I think if I did that I would be shot for blasphemy. In the bad ending, James completely takes over Carl, and you learn what his plot was by watching him do it. The record of the truth is gone, and so is Carl. It's bleak, it's tragic, and I love it. In the good ending, Carl figures himself out. The escape room sends him to the college he dropped out of, and Chase follows Carl through an introspective journey of self-discovery. And what's really interesting is that he ends up agreeing with Jenna, though it has more nuance than that. Carl acknowledges he has an over-reliance on others to solve his problems, and learns to rely more on himself to get through life, which may sound like I'm going, hey, I just resolved my problems off-screen and it was totally sweet, but learning to rely on and accept oneself instead of entirely leaning on someone else is also literally what Carl's been doing with James, so you've been watching him go through a character arc, and it was so subtle you probably didn't notice it until I pointed it out to you. Hell, I didn't notice it until I pointed it out to you. This ending also does not end with Chase and Carl getting together. That may sound counterproductive for a visual novel dating sim, but as I said, I think, I forgot, dating sims don't have to follow the exact same formula every time. It's okay for the romantic leads to not get together by the end. To be honest, it can be more dramatic and interesting than cathartic pleasantry. No, I haven't seen Call Me By Your Name, I've only been gay for like an hour, and this also allows for a fantastic contrast with the bad ending. In the good ending, Carl and Chase don't get together, but resolve their personal problems. In the bad ending, Carl is lost entirely, and then you get the most unsettling handjob in the history of fiction. Like, you got it! You want them to get together? Well, here you go! All the sex scenes in this game are amazing and showcase how sex can be used as plot and character development, as well as how they can be used to elicit emotions other than eroticism. We'll talk about that later. Quite a lot later. The ending of Carl's route is an extremely happy one, but in a way that feels earned. These characters have suffered through some awful, awful shit. They deserve a break, and they get one. It's wonderful. This game is so good, and this route may be different from the others, but that only adds to its memorability. I don't know! No, well, of course you don't! A 50 cal couldn't get through your thick fucking skull! You haven't given me anything to work with! I'm stumbling blind through all this, and you're giving me nothing! I'm helping you as much as you fucking deserve! This is something you got us into! You're getting us out! I'm 
fucking trying! I admit that title will need a bit of explaining, but I can't do that quite yet. Bear with me. Leo's route has a pretty drastic romantic departure from the other routes, being about a relationship that's ended instead of one that's starting. This obviously leads to a different sort of romance. There are several long conversations between Chase and Leo that display a much more conflicted side of things. These two care about each other a lot, but things are fractured and they both want different things. They're trying to put the pieces back together, but they're also trying to navigate how to do that and what the pieces even are. It makes for a lot of engaging writing that evokes conflicting emotions. And yeah, that's true about a lot of this game, but this route in particular has it more. It's also brilliant for this character in particular. You see, I'm told by sources that for furries on itch.io, Leo is the most perfect being to ever exist. He's furry bait on an unsafe level, which creates this scenario. Let's say you're an itch.io furry, and while searching for new games, you manage to get past the fact that Echo is practically unsearchable on this website. You see this wolf. You want this wolf. You download the game and do his route first, because not even TJ's portrayed tears can stop you from winning the heart of this wolf in the dating sim. You then get to navigate an emotionally complex hellscape of heartbreak and abuse. Truly, Howley's evil knows no bounds. But anyway, picking up the pieces. But what are those pieces? Well, let's start with Chase. Chase has pretty much moved on from his relationship with Leo, but to say the relationship ended without closure is the understatement of the millennium. Chase left the town and went to college with barely a goodbye, so he has a lot of unprocessed feelings beneath the surface emotion of being over things. Some part of him still loves Leo, but he left for a reason. That reason is the town of Echo. Echo, and to an extent, Peyton, is Leo's home, and he's not going to leave. That's where his family lives, and that means a lot to him. Chase, on the other hand, has come to hate Echo. He sees it as a ghost town, with minimal redeemable factors that are dwindling fast. While this conflict appears to be fairly surface level, focusing entirely on the town, as time goes on it becomes more apparent that their disagreement isn't that of location, it's a disagreement of ideology. Oh hey, that's what the anchor bracelet represents! I get the symbolism! How did this not make sense when I was in high school? Like, holy sh**! Four years of English classes, and it's not until the week after graduating that analyzing a text for themes and symbolism started to come naturally. I wonder what changed. Think of the imagery of an anchor. What does it represent? What could it symbolize in an optimistic context? In a negative context? What does it mean to you personally? Tell me in the comments, it will let me know if you've gotten this far. Now, the reason I instructed you to call both sides of the metaphorical imagery forth in your mind is because Echo uses both sides simultaneously without saying either side is correct. For the most part, we'll get to it. Leo sees the anchor bracelet as comforting. It symbolizes his home, his family. It keeps him where he wants to be, which is why he still proudly wears the anchor bracelet. Chase views the anchor through a much more cynical lens. To him, the anchor represents being trapped, trying to go somewhere and being held back. That's why Chase doesn't wear his bracelet anymore. The anchor is home, and home is dead weight. Put these two views of the same object together, which creates a well-paired contrast of romanticizing imagery and horror imagery, and it makes a lot of sense why this is the imagery used on the cover and in promotional material. Now, when I say neither side is stated as correct, there's a bit of a complication to that. The game does not say any one side is better, showing each character's contrasting views on this conflict. However, Leo's behavior becomes significantly more concerning over the course of the route due to his feelings toward Chase, and that leads to a distortion of his side of the argument. Does that make the symbolism weaker? No, it just slightly weakens that one statement about the narrative's objectivity on the subject. And I'll also get to explaining how those actions impact the symbolism. And also, objectivity is overrated anyway, so feel free to take this entire paragraph, load it into an M224 60mm lightweight mortar, and fire it at the nearest gay bar. Now, I've brought up Abuse and Leo a couple times, and you're probably asking about that, but there needs to be a good place to start. And what would you know? It's Wednesday! Happy birthday, Carl! Carl's birthday is, first and foremost, pretty darkly funny. The attempt to do something nice for Carl goes absolutely horribly, Every. Single. Time. You do a happy birthday tactical breach and he's sad or hidden or gone or abducted or abducted again. And we brought red velvet cake. I don't even like this. Go a bit deeper though, and it can be a parallel to the entire game. You have a fun idea with good intentions, followed by the slow realization that you've actually walked directly into hell. And then the conflict of the plot begins. Today's conflict is abuse.
Wait. By that, I mean the conflict is about potentially abusive tendencies, not the conflict itself is abusive. Leo has some anger problems. When the homophobic gay meth heads call him a f in the diner, he responds quite normally by committing assault on more than one occasion. And to an extent, there's the righteous anger motivating him, but Clint is also a meth abuser with a minus three to every stat point. And on top of that, Leo can't even correctly remember the events of the fight, which is definitely not great. There's a scene where Leo takes you home after a less than pleasant run-in with Duke, head of the meth heads, and he shows you his computer going, this is my computer where I watch porn. And next to it, there are several large holes in the drywall. As much as furries may want Leo, the reader is going to have to grapple with the fact that he starts with some pretty serious problems, and as the route goes on, his character takes on a borderline monstrous persona. By the time you get to f him, the conflicting emotions of the scene are unbearable. In a good way. I feel like it should be known by now that being good isn't synonymous with eliciting positive emotion, but I still feel the need to make that clear for some reason. That's all kitty sh though. We're in hell, but in the upper layers. Let's talk about the centerpiece of this route. Brian is introduced shortly after Chase agrees to return to Echo for Leo, but you don't really know what's going on. Clint is in a field, being hanged, and Brian is also there. Chase runs away, and yeah, who wouldn't? He looks like this. He's standing next to a hanging man. Cut to later, when you're in the diner with Leo confronting him about some genuinely awful manipulation, we'll get to it, and the C-team show up in their van to kidnap you because of a growing hysteria in the town, we'll get to it as well. You try to run, fail, and wake up in Brian's combination trailer home and BDSM lair. Now, you're here because Duke thinks the hysteria has something to do with you. Brian's BDSM rig is just a convenient way to keep you from running off to him. But to Brian, a man strapped to the BDSM rig is a man strapped to the BDSM rig. Now, being gay for like an hour and 15 minutes, I didn't see the queer theory stuff until it was several weeks after playing the route and finding some notes to copy. So I apologize if I miss some stuff at this point. Now with that out of the way, let's talk about the gay, but violent this time. There's a trope you can find sometimes in trashy horror where the object of fear is sexualized in some way. You're supposed to be scared, but also aroused. You know how in Fear 2, the primary force of horror is Alma, and she's super scary and all, but she's also designed to be hot and want to f*** you? Is that seriously your example? It's the kind of thing that hopes to keep a straight audience engaged by simultaneously pulling on the fear and lust parts of your brain, according to this very scientific chart I made myself. Anyway, Brian is that trope, but gay. And good. He's torturing you for hours, possibly days, and it's quite legitimately disturbing. However, he's torturing you with restraint and breath play. He's torturing you using kink. You don't have to be into this stuff. Hell, I'm not into this stuff. Actually, but the point is that it achieves the goal of using sexuality along with the horror. It's also gay, which makes it automatically better. Sorry, I don't make the rules. I will actually try to explain why the game makes it better, though. Queer theory! Oh god, what if I did the Batman transition? That'd be terrible. <laughs> Brian is virtually every negative gay stereotype rolled into one character. He's not traditionally attractive, his voice is comically high-pitched, he does drugs, sells drugs, engages in kink, is a serial killer, and of course has plenty of mommy issues. He's the evil gay who will give your corpse AIDS. He's literally just the guy from Boys Beware. You know Boys Beware? I showed you Boys Beware earlier. Then during lunch, Ralph showed him some pornographic pictures. Jimmy knew he shouldn't be interested, but, well, he was curious. What Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick, a sickness that was not visible like smallpox, but no less dangerous and contagious, a sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual, a person who demands an intimate relationship with members of their own sex. That guy, right there, that's Brian. And while you may be watching this character description and going, oh god, are you really praising this? The thing is, this character and scene really works best for a queer audience. Despite having every homophobic stereotype imaginable, Brian is not written for the purpose of blatant homophobia. He's the homophobic image of homosexuality that's been burned into our collective subconscious, and the game is forcing you to confront that. Even though I have practically zero experience with being queer, this is still unbelievably powerful and evokes queer introspection in a way that few pieces of media can. 
This is another reason why this being a gay furry dating sim is so effective. Its aesthetic choices are automatically going to net a majority queer audience, and this allows for the powerful queer introspection to fall upon an audience that will actually get it. But I have to be honest, confronting my internalized homophobia in the form of a Dramamine illustration is pretty difficult, though it's not the part that made me title this section the way I did. It'd be nice if someone could save me from this BDSM layer, or at least tie me up in a way I actually like. And we get that in the form of Kudzu, baby! Woo! Kudzu... <laughs> Kudzu is the fairly monotone but pretty chill next-door neighbor of Leo. He's also the secret romantic interest of the route. While Leo spends the route becoming more monstrous, Kudzu's character is fleshed out more, and you start liking him more and more. He has a great sense of humor. He's the one to rescue you instead of Leo. He protects you. He cares about you. He pisses in the woods, and I really don't get that. He runs into the room with a gun to rescue you, and he doesn't even know the gun has the safety on. It's so cute. So now that everyone's been rescued, the villains are tied up, and Leo is beating the shit out of Duke because Leo is pretty violent, to be quite honest, Let's talk about why any of this happened. Way back in part one, Chase mentioned going to Echo to work on a school project that's partly about the mass hysteria that started in the 1800s, and now it's happening again. Why is that? Duke thinks it's because of Chase. And he'd be right. The mass hysteria is caused by an innocent murder, the guilt it causes the murderer, and that murderer being in cringe town long enough for it to build up its ultimate. In this case, Chase's murder of Sydney was the catalyst, so when everyone starts treating the town like a battle royale, all that originates with Chase's guilt. Oh, and secrets. This town needs secrets. We'll get to it. Hey, what about Shadow Chase? We'll get to it! Just keep in mind he exists, and he's a separate entity from Chase. Now, with everyone safe and rescued and okay, there's a very tense couple of scenes where you and the characters ask, are we through the storm? And it's unclear whether you really are. But Brian wasn't shot in the head, so he kidnaps Chase again and takes him into the mines. I don't really have much analysis to write about this part. I just absolutely love it and want to gush about it. You can't stop me. The sunk cost fallacy is in effect by now. You won't leave, I hope. Please don't leave, I worked so hard on this. Please subscribe and keep watching. Leo's route is great but the first two routes I played were genuinely scary. Leo's route wasn't quite hitting that same emotion. Until this part. First of all, Brian tells you his backstory while driving you to the mine entrance, and it's sad, disturbing, and at certain points, really darkly funny. Brian is laughing through the tears as he talks about his abusive upbringing, and all this is accentuated by really obvious sad piano music, but goddamn did it work on me. Then you get dragged into the mine, and it's extraordinarily distressing. The mine is a scary place. It's a small space, deep underground, probably absolutely haunted, and smells like rotting flesh. That gets described in graphic detail, very fun. So, because Brian's mind is essentially being haunted unless he kills people sometimes, you're now being held at gunpoint and about to be added to the pile of corpses. Given the routes I'd played previously, I genuinely had no idea what was going to happen. I believed there was a serious chance Chase was going to die right there. The game had been able to throw my expectations for a loop so many times that I had no clue what to possibly expect. Naturally, the game took this opportunity to throw yet another curveball directly at my head, and it's one of my favorites. I don't have words to articulate how much I love this conversation between Chase and The Voice. It's some of the best horror writing I have ever seen. I'm beneath the mountains of madness, and Brian is getting his psyche ripped apart by a vengeful flesh monster while Chase and The Voice in his head start listing the people Brian has killed. Oh my god, this list is so long! In the editing room again, it seems I've made a small mistake when talking about this scene. The dialogue I'm referring to actually comes from the end of the game, and in this scene, you actually just switch into second person. Did I mention this game has a lot of stuff you could talk about? With one of my favorite scenes ever having passed, everyone returns to normal. The whole group is back together, including Kudzu, baby! And there's a way to escape the mass hysteria. Oh, yeah, the mass hysteria also creates a distorted reality in which you can't leave the area. We'll get to it.
there's a train line that's still running. It passes by every couple hours, and somehow it's the only thing that can enter and exit Echo. This is pretty obviously a huge relief, but the train won't stop. You're going to have to jump on while it's still moving. This calls to mind a story Clint told Chase several hours ago about a man who tried to hop a train in the 50s and fell, getting his legs ripped off in the process. This fear plays in both Chase's mind and your own as you approach the tracks. But it's okay. You're all getting out of here. And then... Leo stops you. He starts talking about how you said you loved him, and you wanted to stay in the town. And you have no idea what he's even talking about, because that didn't happen to you. But you need to confront it... NOW. This brings you to the final choice. The part that broke me. I picked, we'll work something out. I was worried if I didn't say that, he'd force me to stay with him. He was dangerous, and I wanted to avoid making him volatile. But I still cared about him. He was under the influence of the mass hysteria, and I genuinely wanted to work something out with him. Granted, that something would have probably been staying far away, but there would be some closure at least. So I went to hop on the train. Leo seeing me jump onto the train paralleled Leo's image of me leaving originally, and he wouldn't allow that. And Leo pulled me off the train. The shock of this moment is, in all honesty, probably not shocking. Taking a step back to look at it, this is something you could see coming. But I didn't, and I got my legs ripped off for it. And Kudzu got shot for it. Leo tries to bandage my legs, somehow nonchalant about all of this. It's not enough. Of course it's not enough. The story ends with me dying, held by my killer who doesn't believe anything is wrong. With one choice and two minutes, Echo cut through everything, ripped me open, and critically examined a piece of myself and how I think through relationships. That's something no piece of media has ever been able to do. I don't know if anything will ever be able to do it again. The good ending is, as you'd expect, extremely well written and has some great moments. Kudzu becomes the romantic interest and Chase's boyfriend, and it's adorable. Leo isn't wearing the anchor bracelet anymore, symbolizing how he's no longer inescapably tied to the past. It's all great stuff. That feeling from the other ending persisted, but it was different. The emotions of the two endings complemented each other, showing the horror of relationships, but also showing that it's possible to avoid that happening. Cut toxic people from your life. You can work on yourself and be okay. People are there for you. This route was as terrifying as it was incredible, and I will never forget it. Jenna's route contains the most effective jump scare in the history of anything ever. I will not be discussing it further. Jenna's route has been pretty difficult for me to analyze, primarily because the character of Jenna herself is really hard to read. There's a moment where Chase's narration says, Jenna sometimes says things that I suspect carry a lot more meaning than what's on the surface level, but honestly, I'm too dumb to figure it out. And I couldn't relate to that more if I tried. However, the fact that this line is true is, in and of itself, greatly revealing when you're trying to understand how Jenna acts. Jenna is clever, intelligent, probably thinks she's a bit better than you, and is studying psychology to hone these traits. She's been through a lot and acts like she's been through nothing. 
To be honest, she can be kind of difficult to like, but to be more honest, I do anyway. Dangerous bet for me though, since Jenna is often putting on a front, except when she's angry, which combined form like 90% of her time in the story. Chase calling attention to the depth of what Jenna says is practically an invitation for the audience to figure out what that depth is. And I think the best way to figure that out is to deconstruct her superiority complex. Why does Jenna think she's better than you? To start, she's putting on a front. Now, most of the characters are doing something like that. TJ is hiding his motivations, Carl downplays his anxiety, Leo is protective in a way that manifests as violent and abusive tendencies. But Jenna's mask seems far more deliberately constructed than the others. She's the only one who looks like she has nothing going on, so you're initially given the impression that her taking the high ground is good and justified, an impression she wants you to have. And I have to admit, some of the time she's right. Jenna is able to tear down a person by picking apart the reasons why they're acting the way they are. Like a debate YouTuber, but in a context where their abilities are actually useful. When Leo, uh, sexually harasses the protagonist in Chuck E. Cheese, Jenna is not only the one to stop him, but she does it by going beyond the surface level of you're doing terrible things in a terrible place. She calls out his motivation. Leo is in a place he used to go when he was younger with a love interest when he was younger. And so he does something he used to do in that situation, not realizing that Chase has moved on a bit and doesn't want to get frisky in Freddy Fazbear's. This completely tears down any ability of Leo's to fight back. He's left defenseless. His defenses are actively stripped away from him. There's a sort of brutality here. Jenna is in the right, but she rips Leo apart verbally in the way I'm scared Leo could rip me apart physically. Wow, Lockie, that sounds kind of f***ed up to be attracted to. Correct. So what is Jenna putting on a front for? Well, Jenna's been through a lot. Her childhood was spent with abusive family and peers until drugs were introduced to the situation, which left her remaining time with abusive and tweaking family and peers. It was a very bad time, and it's heavily impacted how Jenna sees everything. Like mental health. Going back to Carl's route for a moment, when Jenna tears Carl down at the party, she's doing so as a result of her view of mental health. She views it as a very individual process, and doesn't think that you need to rely on other people to improve yourself, because that's what she's had to do, and for her it went okay. Jenna went through hell and came out the other side on her own, so so can you. But why does she protect TJ so much then, I hear you ask. Actually no, it's just me trying to make sense of this character. Because she doesn't think TJ's problems are a mental health concern. She sees the surface level uwu small TJ as the entirety of TJ's character. Do you see what's happening here? The characterization is being done across multiple routes, and it's brilliant! Everything is so tightly woven together that you can see pieces of other routes, and you probably won't even notice it until way later on. It's so smart. This game genuinely floors me with how smart it is. Even the romance in this route, which I think is the weakest in the game, is still okay. Not great, mind you, but there's enough good material to keep my interest. The romance between Chase and Jenna doesn't feel particularly intimate, but that's because their dynamic is different from the other routes. Chase and Jenna's relationship is very banter-focused. Their flirting takes on the form of teasing each other, and while from an outsider's perspective that may not seem like romance, it absolutely is. And it's very fun. And I like it a lot. My feelings for Jenna are very similar to my feelings for Teach. I have to admit though, while the dynamic is unique and fun, when the mood actually gets romantic, it's a bit generic. This is the only route in which a sex scene doesn't contribute anything to character or plot. There's also the fact that the entire romantic aspect of their relationship is optional, which means it effectively can't contribute to plot and character. On one hand, this is a shame, but on the other hand, it allows the gay people in the audience to not have to interact with a heterosexual relationship if they don't want to, which is honestly a nice touch. And on the third hand, extending from off-screen, it makes Jenna's character moments occur outside of the context of a relationship, which is an interesting shift. Another interesting thing about Jenna is that she has Native American heritage, which takes a larger role in this route. Now, I'm about as well equipped to talk about this subject matter as I am to talk about basically anything, which is to say, shut me up before I have a chance to speak, but thank god Echo doesn't seem to do a terrible job with this. Granted, I'm not the person to ask about it, but I didn't see any problems that stuck out to me. What I do feel more qualified to talk about is how this heritage influenced Jenna. She hates her family to the point of running away from them to go to college, but still finds value in her tribe's culture. While Chase and Jenna are out searching for Carl, because you show up for his party and he's missing, she tells you a story about her grandmother. She used to use old radio equipment to broadcast a sort of radio show to anyone who caught the signal, so she started talking with a lot of truckers passing along the highway. 
On one of those calls, she had a long conversation with a trucker who was having a terrible day, and ended up befriending him. People cared about her. When she died, dozens of truckers came to her funeral. It's a really fascinating scene, watching Jenna tell this story under the pale light of the moon and the artificial light of a street lamp. In contrast to that, we have Heather. Heather has seriously hurt Jenna in the past, and her cruelty made her situation prior to running away orders of magnitude worse. As a result of this, she kind of absolutely hates her. Heather is everything Jenna hates about the town. She's everything sucky about her upbringing made manifest. She's also really similar to a lot of girls I met in high school, which made it really hard to write about her without casually being... Thank you, Echo. I'm eternally grateful for you forcing me to confront my internalized misogyny. I'm not a good person! This was the last route designed, and it has a bit of experimental gameplay depth. Rather than a binary good ending, bad ending, Jenna's route has a sort of point system. At several points throughout the route, you'll be presented with a choice, and that choice will give or detract points from Jenna's... I don't know... sanity meter? And by the time you get to the pivotal scene, if Jenna has a high enough sanity meter, you get the good ending, and if not, you don't. This is pretty basic stuff. I mean, hell, this is kind of like the poem mechanic from DDLC. But it's cool to see, and I have to give props for the experimentation. So what is that pivotal scene? So it's... Well, it's weird. But I love it. And we're going to get to it. But I have more on my checklist. For a route belonging to Jenna, Leo takes a lot of space in the route. This is because Jenna's route is also kind of Leo's route again, but with a different dynamic that reveals something new about the character. Leo still has the transition from normal to monster, but you get to watch it happen from an observer's perspective. Because you're pursuing Jenna, you don't have as much of the emotional turmoil watching Leo grow more violent. Chase can see it more objectively as a bad thing, but what's really fascinating is the why. Remember when I said at the end of Leo's route it felt like Leo was talking to a completely different person? Well, he was. Meet Shadow Chase. Aside from being the edgiest sounding thing in the entire game, Shadow Chase is a character Leo has been hallucinating for the better part of a couple years. There's a monologue I didn't mention until now where Leo talks in detail about how he imagines Chase is with him throughout the day, and as it turns out, this should be taken at face value. Leo literally imagines Chase is with him throughout the day. But looking at Shadow Chase, single, can fly, in this genuinely creepy dream sequence, there's something odd you might notice about it. This image is listed in the game's files as thehey.png, which is just one of my favorite file names ever. More importantly, he has no goatee. Chase has a goatee. But he didn't in the past. Shadow Chase is not Chase. He's the idea of Chase Leo cherishes in his mind. The dialogue exemplifies this further. Every time he speaks, a scratchy record sound plays, like something is being played back on a distorted vinyl. This is because he only ever says things Chase has said. He can't say anything new, only repeat what Leo has heard him say. The track being played is Leo's ideal image of Chase, and the vinyl is his memory, spliced together and distorted with time. He is a physical manifestation of what Leo wants based on his past, and the fact that Chase is a separate person from this memory amalgamation further demonstrates that he's not the same person he once was, and Leo can't just pretend that the past is the present. This is, hands down, some of the best writing I'll ever see in my life. It's amazing symbolism made digestible for idiots like me by literalizing it, and given an incredible reveal to boot. I love it so much. Seeing past images of people, called the hum by some of the characters, also appears for other characters, most notably with Keith. In the loose coalition of meth heads, Keith was held in the highest regard by far, but at some point in the late 2000s, he vanished. Keith can be viewed as a sort of metaphor for what made the town enjoyable to these people. In a sense, he was the life of the town, holding everyone together and being their support, until one day he was just... gone. No one knows how to get him back, and most people have resigned themselves to the idea that they'll never get him back. Keith's disappearance and the lack of closure adds a note of tragedy to this group of junkies, who have been worn down throughout their lives already and now have had their one support taken from them. But of those who disappeared, Mika came back, and thank God for it, because Mika is extremely likable. He starts out as kind of an asshole, but you bond with him over some personal scenes with him, as well as being f***ing terrified of Leo. One scene that stands out to me is when Mika and Chase are just talking outside the motel Chase is staying at. Chase wants to know where Carl is, and thinks Mika may know. Mika doesn't trust Chase, but warms up to Chase and helps him by the end of the scene. 
The best way I can describe this conversation is theatrical. Mika is acting really strange and is possibly high, so he ends up dancing around in a half trance before leaping off a dumpster and getting real. It's surreal, and in a game that's already pretty surreal, it managed to stand out to me. After that, he becomes a pretty good friend. Even in a fight with Brian, he makes an attempt to help Chase and Leo. It doesn't help, but the attempt was made. But now, everyone's captured again. Duke still thinks Chase is behind all the mass hysteria, and he's trying to get to the bottom of things. Haha, <laughs> look at him go. He'll never actually learn the truth. This is so sad. And now we get to confrontation with my homophobia demon, party edition! Complete with, oh my god, this body horror is fucking disgusting, oh my god! Escape! Cry for a bit, because Kudzu probably dies in this route. Remember the voice in Chase's head? He was a pretty big deal in TJ's route, but not so much with Carl and Leo. But he's back in a big way. The voice in this route acts as a commentary on the futility of choice in Echo and Chase's lack of agency. You also get to learn the voice's origin, so now no theory videos need to be made about him. Thank God. Let's start with the origin. Around the halfway point of the game, there's an extended dream sequence where Janice and... Sydney's dad? I'm not even going to try to ask about that. So the two are driving and not really paying attention to the road, and they hit some guy. His leg is horribly mangled, and while Sydney's dad and Janice do their best to lift the car up to help the guy escape, they aren't able to do enough, and the guy gets killed. They bury him as quickly as possible. A person is murdered, his murder goes unpunished, the drivers live with the guilt. The cycle of the town continues. Then his body is discovered by Chase. In a moment similar to when Brian is about to shoot you in the head, the voice tells you to dig. Just do it. And then you do that, despite being very confused about the whole ordeal. The voice's name is Sam. It's good to finally learn who he is. This scene is great on its own and reveals the identity of Sam in a fantastic way, but the impact it has on Chase contextualizes his lack of agency in a really scary way, because Chase has none. The choices made throughout the game aren't Chase's decisions, they're Sam's. You're controlling Sam, who is controlling Chase. I won't be so hyperbolic as to say this completely upends how you look at your protagonist, and by adding a blatantly artificial barrier between you and the main character, it highlights the much more subtle artificial barrier between you and the main character that is inherent to all of fiction. But someone is holding the remote. And that someone is me! When the mass hysteria hits, you spend a long time searching for the squad, who have been scattered. While this is happening, Heather is holding Carl hostage and has shot her dad. Everyone finds Carl, yay, and Heather's dad's corpse, not yay, and everyone learns Heather wants to blow up the nearby dam. Wow, that's a bit of a shift. Yeah, well, I've got the need for speed. I want to get this video done sometime this year. Heather's dad worked at the dam, and Heather has a bit of knowledge on how to operate it. And because she's completely taken by mass hysteria, she wants to keep the town from hurting anyone else by opening the dam and flooding Echo. Now, at this point, Heather's initial image has revealed another side to it, that being being a complete emotional wreck, which was also a lot of people in my high school, go figure, there's something deeply wrong with Heather, and while her actions may be those of a Batman villain, she's a scared girl with a gun, suffering from a devastating emotional breakdown. This is the moment of Jenna's narrative climax. Haha, <laughs> narrative. Whether she tries to talk Heather down from her episode or not depends on what image of the town you gave her in the route. If she views the town as redeemable, she'll see Heather as a redeemable part of a redeemable town, and try to talk her down. If she believes the town makes monsters of us all, she has Heather get f***ing shot and then goes to flood the area herself. This ending feels rushed, to be quite honest. I think it's a decent moment of shock, but it could have done a lot more to provide closure on character and thematic pieces of the story in a more bleak context. This is the bad ending that feels most like a bad ending in a video game. Thankfully, it's actually kind of difficult to get this ending. Even intentionally, it took me a couple tries. So the vast majority of people will get to see the good ending. Which is good, because the good ending is good. First of all, it feels like a quest in Fallout New Vegas, and I love that. It somehow manages to fit with the tone of everything else, while still being deeply evocative of a completely different game to me. Flynn even has a lever-action repeater! Oh yeah, and it has a lot of character significance, where Jenna provides support and aid to someone she hates, and she's showing unconditional empathy. It's a lot of character development and progression and stuff, and Flynn! Flynn has a lever-action repeater! He is probably waiting in the bushes like he's going to use f VATS! It's so fun! So with the dam no longer in danger of being opened, and the situation seemingly being resolved by authorities, everyone has a little conclusion moment in a diner. It's nice. 
There's a lot of small, jokey character moments that really stick out to me, like Flynn reluctantly ordering pink lemonade or Chase eating sugar packets like an absolute cretin or me. You don't get Jenna in the end, which as I said is totally fine and well done here, and there's a small ending scene with her at a jukebox. Like it's the 50s. God I love retro aesthetics. The final choice is also a really great hint at just how much Sam controls Chase. You're given a bunch of music options, but no matter what you pick, Sam is silent and Chase lets Jenna choose. Things are better, everyone is safe, but Sam has far more power over people than the player or the protagonist realize. And you better believe we'll get to that. Flynn is the hardest route to talk about. I don't even know where to start. It's genuinely one of the most complex pieces of fiction I've ever seen, but there's meaning to be found in this route, and by God, I will find the meaning. Locke, are you stalling on talking about Flynn's route by writing completely unrelated videos? No! The day after the fight on the river, Chase goes fishing with him and Carl, which is a fun scene that eases some of the tension established yesterday. Oh, wait, no, Chase is naked and Flynn is pinning him to his truck. This is the most humiliating choice in the game, and it's not close. If you couldn't tell, this route gets very horny very quickly. And while that may seem a bit strange in comparison to the other routes, it's actually a very smart choice for telling this story. That's right, we've reached the part of the video where I legitimately defend gay furry sex as a storytelling tool. So let's start with something that most of the non-furries in the audience are thinking. That doesn't sound appealing to me in the slightest. But here's the thing. A sex scene does not have to be erotic in order for it to be effective. If the only purpose of a sex scene is to be erotic, then I wouldn't say it has no purpose, but it's a missed opportunity. Sex can be used to develop characters as individuals, further flesh out the bond between characters, and even advance the plot. Using this first scene with Flynn as an example, we can see that the game is doing all three of these things. First of all, it provides a great deal of character development to Flynn Chase's individuals. For those who asked, why the hell was Chase naked to begin with, he was swimming in the pond to untangle the fly fishing baits, and he was joking with Flynn about the fact that he did this. I realize that sounds bad, but roll with me. Flynn sees this, takes it dead seriously, and immediately decides it's sex time. They're in a public parking lot, by the way. It's empty, but it's a public parking lot. This characterizes Chase as the kind of person who will turn his nudity into a joke, and characterizes Flynn as the kind of person who will turn that same nudity into sex. Secondly, it establishes the dynamic between Flynn and Chase as something drastically different from the other routes. Sex is usually something the other routes save for very late in the game, always near or past the halfway point. By including a sex scene within an hour of the start of the route, this subverts the expectations of both Chase and the player. The player is caught off guard because of how early this happens, and Chase is caught off guard because this is a completely new facet of his childhood friend. Neither of you are expecting sex at this point or in this way. And what further complicates things is that Flynn decides to stop as quickly as he decides to start. With this scene, sex is introduced to the relationship between these two, but Chase is holding none of the cards, something that proves to be prevalent later in the route. And while it may not be the strongest argument, this scene does advance the story. In terms of plot, it's the start of Flynn and Chase's passionate whirlwind holiday tailspin, and thematically, it establishes how little Chase really knows Flynn. This creates an emotional ambiguity, where the characters on some level want what's happening, but something is definitely wrong, or at least not normal. Like with every route, it blends romance and horror. It's just using sex to do it this time. All of this, and not once did I need to mention the erotic nature of the scene. Which is a shame, because it's also really hot. Which is something Leo doesn't particularly like. Or Jenna. Or TJ. Picking Flynn's route is an interesting choice, because when the river scene splits everyone apart, Flynn is the one who causes it. Choosing him at this point means not going to comfort TJ, not going to calm Leo down, not staying with Carl and sharing a moment of quiet empathy with each other for having to be in this situation. Choosing it expresses a desire to understand the accuser. No wonder Jack Saint picked his route first. Bastard. Irrational bitterness aside, Leo's jealousy alters the dynamic of the relationship in yet another new way. In this route, the romance feels forbidden. Leo can't know Chase and Flynn are f***ing, and Jenna can't know Chase's sympathies are with Flynn. This is exemplified by a scene in which Chase hides under the bathroom sink to help keep Leo from knowing he's in Flynn's house. This scene is also in second person. You, yes, you, the player, 
astrally project out of Chase and move through the house to watch the scene, which is somehow made weirder by the scene consisting of Leo doing a Sherlock Holmes montage to reach the conclusion of I smell cum. Leave. I thought about why this scene existed for a while, because on a surface level, it's completely out of left field. However, after giving it a great deal of thought, I came to the conclusion that it's another way of highlighting Chase's inability to truly know Flynn, as well as the separation between player and player character. Chase literally does not watch the events of this scene. You do. So when you return to Chase, you're doing so with knowledge of something he doesn't have. But that's not a new thing. If you've played Echo, which you better have to be this far in, you know loads of information Chase doesn't know. The gap in understanding why things are happening is getting wider by the hour. This is just taking that intellectual gap and making it too obvious to avoid. It's also foreshadowing. Let's talk about Daxton. I didn't know how to segue into this, I'm sorry. Kudzu may be the best boy, but because he becomes a main character in Leo's route, it doesn't make sense to call him a side character. This means I can say Daxton is my favorite side character without blaspheming. Daxton is a chill dude, and his interest in nerd media gives him a level of instant relatability that makes him seem like a guy I'd really like to hang out with, even if he's a Reddit moderator. Daxton's a big fan of Ad Astra, in this universe Ad Astra is Star Trek, and he'll talk out length about it with minimal provocation. 45 pages into this script, I can relate. He's also a straight man in a way that actually works. For one, he knows how to stay out of dramatic scenes unlike this sparkle dog mother- And for two, in his scenes he's actually able to be an interesting character and contribute more than just a stupid smirk. He's great. I'd play video games with him. Getting back to the narrative, we have Flynn and Chase's big quotes romantic climax to their passionate whirlwind holiday tailspin. <laughs> Passion. After watching at Astra, falling asleep, and seeing Shadow Chase in the reflection of the window, you notice that Flynn is gone. His phone is propped up on the counter with an address, and because you have no idea what's going on, you bring Daxton with you to the address. This is the smoke room. The smoke room is a gay sex bar in the Native American territory, and- <laughs> Okay, I need to do another tangent. This is why Jenna and Flynn have such intense disagreements with one another. As a descendant of Native Americans, Jenna isn't a fan of the exploitation that occurs in contemporary times. It's like, have you ever seen the cigarette shops on Native American territories? You know why that's the case? It's like, a thing. Flynn frequently visits the casino and smoke room on the reservation, and doesn't see a problem with him doing it. Jenna does. There's a lot of small elements to this discussion, and all I know about it is that I don't know enough to comment on it without looking like a fool. An analysis of this discussion is better suited to someone else. Once again, I call you to action. Play Echo. Maybe you'll be able to talk about this better than me. Also subscribe. Upon getting to the smoke room, you meet a very surprised Flynn and Ryan, who only appears for five minutes but still brings me joy. Flynn brought you here, to the gay sex bar, to have gay sex in the gay sex room. This scene is a little hard to get through, but it's fascinating. It's the thematic nexus point of Chase and Flynn's relationship. I find the relationship between these two to be fascinating because Flynn is a deeply compelling character who you do not get to know. He alternates between horny and pushing Chase away because he doesn't want a relationship, because he can't do relationships. Where Leo can really only fuck people he's already attracted to, Flynn can only fuck people. Full stop. He keeps you at arm's length even as you blow him, because he's not emotionally equipped to do anything else. The smoke room scene is where a line is crossed. Chase has mixed feelings about the dynamic of things between him and Flynn, but is willing to go along with this. But this scene involves having sex with Flynn in the company of other people, and they join in. And they're horses. Of course they're horses. There is no cock like Being a regular patron of the smoke room is something he doesn't tell anyone, especially not his old friends. He reveals this to one person, technically two, but Daxon doesn't count, once, and it ends with Chase stumbling out of the warehouse. Flynn's choice to keep everyone at arm's length is an act of self-preservation, and to an extent, it's a smart one. Flynn, as it turns out, was right about everything. Carl needed to learn to rely on himself for support. Jenna needed to work on her superiority complex. Leo was obsessed with Chase. TJ was hiding what he knew about Sydney, albeit in a repressed memory. And Chase was cycling through everyone for sex. But what was Flynn's issue? It can be hard to tell when he keeps himself so emotionally distant, but that's exactly it. His inability to be read in response is, in and of itself, the problem. He doesn't trust people, not even his closest friends. What I also love about the smoke room is that this is nowhere near the end of the game. There's still a lot to play after this, but the romance is effectively shattered. 
It feels weird. It feels uncomfortable. The romance was the refuge from the horror in most routes, but here, it's taken away far sooner than usual. Instead, you have to deal with your school project. Yeah, remember that? Do you remember why you're here? This route isn't as much of a lore dump as Carl's route, but it presents itself in a much more straightforward manner. You learn about the town of Echo and its early government, and it's really interesting. You also have a barbecue with the other members of the cast. Given the, shall we say, emotionally complex previous day, this is a very needed relief. There's great banter, a relaxing atmosphere, and a good time to be had. And then something weird happens. Let's talk about the monster. This route has an actual monster in it, separate from the Carl ghosts, somewhat separate from the mass hysteria. On a purely design level, I love this monster. It looks, no, it sounds creepy as all hell. You don't really see it in image form, so a lot of the horror comes from how it's described. Its skin looks burned off. Its movement is fast and impossibly jittery, like a strobe light. Its face looks like a wall socket, which you think would look kind of funny more than anything else, but when you're shown a socket with liminal space lighting, kind of scary. Jenna used to see this monster a couple times when she was younger, and Chase is talking with Jenna about the subject. Then there's the visual novel equivalent of a hard cut, and you're in a wrestling match. Actually, you're watching a wrestling match. And you're not Chase. It's finally time to talk about Sydney. To understand Sydney, one needs to understand Sydney's dad. Sydney's dad is abusive, but not in a stereotypical way. There's a lot of verbal and emotional abuse, and it feels far more grounded because of that. This also makes it extremely triggering, that content warning is no joke, but this is also the best handling of abuse in a story I've ever seen, and the game goes above and beyond in tying it to the characters brilliantly. Sydney is a pretty violent kid, bullying people like TJ relentlessly. But it's the way Sydney imagines his violence that's important. It's wrestling, the most homoerotic of all the violent sports. And that's the problem Sydney's dad has. It's violent crap, but because he's trying to take Sydney hunting of all things, it's clear the violence isn't the problem on its face. The problem is that it's gay violent crap. So Sydney gets yelled at and goes hunting. And stupid tangent, I know, but the attention to detail here really surprised me. I thought it was really weird at first that they were hunting with 22 caliber rifles that fired shotgun blasts, but that's actually a thing. It's called snake shot, and it's used to hunt birds. I was surprised by this a lot, since it... Moving on. Sydney goes hunting. He can't hold the gun right. More getting yelled at. I feel unwell. So it's pretty clear Sydney hates his dad, but that's a very surface level reading of how abuse works. Sydney's feelings about his dad are complicated and nuanced, and while the surface emotion is deep, bitter hatred. Beneath that, there's a similarly deep longing to be loved. You can see the hatred in the wrestling match Sydney imagines himself in, where he beats his opponent, who is kind of his dad, really brutally and unmasks him. A super emasculating wrestling move that mirrors Sydney's desire for his dad to get his tough guy act and body torn to shreds. The player, watching all of this, probably agrees with the hatred part, but might be a bit confused about why they'll be expected to also want to be cared about by him. To do this, uh... They made him hot. His design has the same appealing dad energy as Joel, or Kratos, or Booker DeWitt. Every video game ever made has appealing dads now, and by making Sydney's dad look like that, the audience makes that connection, at least a little. You may not notice this very much. I didn't notice this very much either. But it's objectively true, and now that I've pointed it out to you, it's impossible to unsee. There's also a lot of really well done writing here once the twist is introduced. The two characters find themselves in a clearing in the woods, and in the clearing is an old-fashioned van. The same van that, several decades prior, ran over and killed Sam. The memory and guilt of this, along with the implied supernatural forces that would make this exact van appear in the first place, is what pushes Sidney's dad to shoot himself. The pain keeps coming back to him, and it's here where Sidney's initial hatred gives way to genuinely loving and caring about his father. This scene is absolutely heartbreaking. The fact that Sydney's dad died is well established, so you already know how this scene ends. Watching Sydney break down sobbing as he begs his dad not to shoot is... Well, it hurts. And I say that as someone who isn't personally affected by the subject matter. The game then cuts back to exactly where it left off, with TJ eating a Rice Krispie Treat and helping Carl through a job interview. It doesn't go well, because Carl hasn't gone through his character arc in Carl's route. I never mentioned Flynn works for the town. Shit. Flynn works for the town! 
you're in the town hall now. TJ is here too, because Flynn wants to confront TJ about Sydney. Remember that? So the confrontation is going... fine. But then Jenna shows up to confront Flynn. And then Leo shows up to confront Flynn. Everyone is arguing. I feel ill. You have to disingenuously condemn Flynn because you subconsciously know the truth will make him f***ing kill you. TJ breaks down and says he saw a monster in the water when Sydney drowned. He all but accuses you. There's a weird moment where the narration jumps between first person, second person, and Sam, who seems to be addressing you. Or someone outside. You essentially get hit so hard your perspective shifts. And then, gunshots. The mass hysteria is here. Everyone runs like hell, and it's here. At this moment, where things get really weird. Flynn shoves Chase into the town hall storage closet. He tries to move some stuff around to figure out how to escape, and encounters a black widow. Then another. Then an entire nest of them. Chase gets bitten by dozens of these spiders, losing all sanity in the moment, and throwing his clothes off because they're getting under them. Then the poison goes to your head and you start hallucinating going back in time. Everything is freaky as shit, time isn't making sense, the game is playing the death music because it's pretty likely you're going to die, and then everything goes dark. You and I haven't gotten the chance to speak together, have we? Why would we? I always seem to find myself being upstaged. He really seems to need that spotlight. I don't mean to sound bitter when I say that. I wouldn't want what he's aspiring to have. I see myself as more of a guiding presence. It's simple, really. He does something vile. I deal with it, and he becomes a better person for it. Without me, he'd still be making the same stupid, selfish, arrogant mistakes. You know, sometimes he thinks he doesn't need me, that I'm only here to hurt him, to ruin things. He's wrong, and deep down he knows that. He knows that if I weren't here, he would still be nothing but a monster. But that's okay. I'm here for him. The next time he makes another stupid mistake, we'll get through it together. I don't think I've properly introduced myself. My name is... When the game continues, it's with another flashback. And at first, it's not clear whose perspective you're even inhabiting. But it's probably not Chase, because whoever this is, they're shooting arrows at Osama bin Laden. Then Sydney shows up. You're playing as Flynn now. Little ten-year-old, already openly gay, kind of Islamophobic Flynn. This flashback does two things. Firstly, it shows what Flynn lost. You can tell really quickly that Flynn and Sydney have a very strong friendship. Even with the setup of Sydney's dad having shot himself, you can tell Sydney feels a little better with him around. And Flynn does something the audience has never seen him do trust. Flynn trusts Sydney deeply. He's repeatedly said Sydney was his best friend, but it's not until now that we finally get to know what that really means. And we see this in a moment of deep bonding, the second thing this flashback does. Sydney's dad is dead. Flynn needs to bury the body. The horror of this scene should be obvious, and the game does a great job of capitalizing on it. The process is described in what I could probably call the game's signature extensive detail, which makes it almost sickening due to the grounded nature of it all. But Flynn, God bless him, is able to mentally tank all of this even when his hands bleed from digging and he has to break the corpse's arm to fit it in the grave. It threads the needle of being in character for Flynn while being so dramatically beyond the Call of Duty that the viewer finds it grotesque. And it goes further, characterizing the relationship between these two friends better than any description could really provide. Flynn would bury a body for Sydney. That's more than he could say about basically anyone else. This flashback is doing what no one else possibly could. Not Chase, not Flynn's fuck buddies, not anybody but you, the player. Let you understand him. When the flashback ends, Flynn remains the point of view character. This is an unfamiliar person to inhabit, but not an unwelcome one. 
At this point in the game, especially if you've played the other routes, Flynn can certainly be an asshole, but he's also confident, capable, and usually correct. And because you're getting a better understanding of him, he's getting more relatable. Well, to you at least. What's genius about the perspective shift is that it allows you to know Flynn better, but Flynn as a character gets to continue being distrustful and keeping everyone at an arm's length. He gets depth as a character without breaking it. It's a bold way to subvert expectations, but as I'll soon demonstrate, it's the greatest choice ever made. After a bit of conversation at Flynn's house, everyone decides to put aside their differences a bit in the face of the mass hysteria and go back to the town hall for Chase. The good news is that Chase is actually okay and not dead. Only one spider bit him. The bad news is everyone else is locked into a battle royale whether they like it or not. But things don't go on like they usually do. There's a town meeting, and everyone tries to get a grip on what's going on. It's an interesting change of pace to see Duke making his arguments about the Hysteria's origin to a group of people instead of just Chase. The nature of his argument also changes, where he usually is trying to restrain Chase long enough to get a better understanding of the situation. In Flynn's route, his argument is that Chase needs to be shot in the head right now. This meeting also has the only image of gore in the entire game. This boar. Look at how they massacred my boar. Everyone decides this is pretty self-evidently bad and gets in the car to book it out of town. At this point, I want to make it clear that my next point is less of a critique and more of a rumination on my experience playing this part, and what it could have maybe been. I think that Flynn's route could have fully broken the fourth wall and it would have worked. That's not to say it would have been better that way, I think it's more unique as is, but I want to share my experience to show what I mean. When the group tries to drive away, they quickly run into a problem. The laws of reality are bending to physically prevent the car from leaving the county. As you get closer to the freeway, to Peyton, Flynn's mind starts to wander, and by the time he stops zoning out, the car is now driving in the opposite direction. This happens several times, getting more distressing with each non-Euclidean U-turn. Now, call me naive, Go on, but I thought this was a sign that the game was folding in on itself and was about to go meta. By this point I was locked in and fully relating to the character's growing feelings of hopelessness. That feeling was then combined with everyone's confusion about why this is happening, as well as the line, it feels like we're in some kind of loop. A visual novel using the word loop or any similar word in this context is almost always going to be imagery that goes past the characters and to the player themselves, since visual novels are often designed to be played and replayed. Them saying they're in a cycle is metatextually true. You've played this game four times now and there's no way for any of the characters to escape that. The lines about not understanding why these events are happening struck me as similarly metatextual. None of these characters know that they're in a fictional story, but they know something is cosmically wrong about the world they're in. This reading led me to the conclusion that the suffering of the characters was being caused by my action as a player to continue playing. And this conclusion was powerful. My emotions relating to the cast made me truly distraught over the idea that I was hurting them. And this was made even more powerful by the simultaneous conclusion that I'm so compelled by the story that I can't stop playing. I have to see what happens next, and in doing so, I am hurting them more. This is, to simultaneously praise and insult myself, a very complex and clever way to make a very stupid argument that fundamentally misunderstands the level Echo operates on. It is the analysis of an Echo player whose only real frame of reference is Doki Doki Literature Club, which he will cling to like a life raft even as he knows it's faulty. It is a misreading of the text. But the emotions I felt as a result of it were real and incredibly powerful. In that moment, I thought it was doing what Spec Ops The Line tried to do, and it was doing that better as a result of me being so attached to the cast. Now, none of this is to say I think the game would be better if it went traditionally meta. While it could have been more effective than any game I've ever played that previously tried to make the player conflicted about the actions they perform in the game, it would have been more generic. It wouldn't have fit with the rest of the game's interest in staying within its own fiction. And we would have probably missed out on the ending as it appears in the game, which is, to put it mildly, immaculate. The other aspect as to why this reading is incorrect is that this scene appears beat for beat in a different route, and ultimately, Echo has far more planned with this imagery than just a look to the audience. After a while, the socket man sees the car and runs into it so hard the car flies halfway across the county and into the lake, which I know is supposed to be scary and disorienting, but I always imagine it happening with Gmod physics, which makes it really funny. Then everyone almost drowns in the lake, which achieves the goal of being genuinely scary and disorienting. This isn't really something I can show at this point, but I want to reiterate how good the game is at making me not have any idea what's going to happen next. 
every route is able to introduce something so dramatically new, replaying this game five times still has material that shocks and scares. Flynn talks with Carl and Daxton, trying to make sense of things and figure out where to go. Then they vanish. Flynn wanders around for a while, egged on by Sam that he's going the right way. This brings Flynn to the smoke room, where he meets... Sydney. When you show up in the smoke room for the first time, it seems like the climax of the romance, but not explicitly related to the horror. This scene brings it back, and with the context of the previous scene in the smoke room, it adds a level of character development so clever and subtle I had to steal more notes for it. Flynn is dissociating, and the place he goes to in his head is the gay sex bar. This is a moment of deep vulnerability inherent to Flynn being the POV character, and it marks a turning point in how he's developed. In all previous scenes, Flynn's mental and emotional depth was material that couldn't be told to the other characters for logical reasons. It's part of his character not to want to talk about those things. But now, what's happening to Flynn physically cannot be articulated to anyone else. He's gone from choosing to distance himself from the others to quite literally being unable to do so. The act of his dissociating also draws a parallel to Sidney, who is doing the same thing in his flashback. The fact that this is happening is already characterization, but the added level of things being overtly unreal allows for things to enter a state of surreal horror, such as when Sydney says this and scares the hell out of me. If you couldn't tell by the... This isn't really Sydney. He's a construct of Flynn's imagination. He's actually very similar to Shadow Chase in the nature of his existence. To Flynn, this is the ideal of Sydney existing in his own head, much like Shadow Chase was the ideal of Chase that Leo created in his own head. But where Leo's construct of Chase can only exist in the parameters of what Chase has been in the past, Flynn's construction of Sydney has to be an extrapolation of the boy he knew a decade ago into a grown man. He's wearing the same style of clothes, he has the same interest in pirates and wrestling, and his behavior isn't really any different. However, Sydney can't just be created based on Sydney's past, and the way Flynn fills in the details of what Sydney could be reveals a lot about both of them. For example, Shadow Sydney is a drug abuser. This is honestly a pretty accurate hypothesis. Sydney is an abuse victim in the haunted meth town. Statistically, he's pretty likely to be a drug addict. And that's... really kind of depressing. It adds a note of tragedy to a character who's already dead. There's a feeling of stopped time in the smoke room. If Flynn wanted to just stay in this building, this headspace, forever, he could. But he won't. Flynn knows this space isn't real, and that's not what he's here for. His entire goal throughout this game has been to learn the truth about what happened to Sydney, and he's not going to stop moving forward. Before he leaves though, Sydney, now revealed to be Sam, tells him this, quote, You can chase the truth until you're red in the face. It ebbs and flows like the tide. You can ride it. Each time the tide comes in, it's a little less of what it once was, abstracted. It goes where sorrow sprouts, and takes with it what it can before rolling back out. Some tides are particularly large, you burn them all down around you until only the truth remains. This is where the game gets abstract. The barrier of what is real and what is imagined has, both narratively and metaphysically, broken down quite a bit. Flynn dies, but he continues to live in a state of possibly supernatural life. He starts time traveling. It gets very confusing very quickly. Which, for the record, is a success of the writing. The player's confusion as they watch all this happen is only a fraction of Flynn's confusion as he lives through the events. But taking a step back from the emotional wreck the game left me, the ending acts as a beautiful and incredibly powerful thematic climax. Let's start with Flynn's death. When Flynn leaves the smoke room and wanders through the infinite room, in reality he's walking into the mine, which is on fire. The only other route in which Flynn dies is in TJ's route, and it's no coincidence that TJ's route is the only other route where Flynn actively tries to get the truth about what happened at the lake. Flynn's search for the truth is what destroys him. As the game itself says, this town needs secrets. In TJ's route, though, this pursuit of truth leads to pretty straightforward destruction. Flynn's route plays this idea in a more complex way, simultaneously adding depth to how said destruction plays out and twisting the idea of what destruction in search of truth can mean for him. After Flynn dies, he becomes the socket monster, and the purpose of the socket monster becomes clear. It's a spirit of vengeance. His scales have barely fallen away from his skin before he wanders through the flames and does a retributive supernatural murder. He continues going through several points through time, watching various murders. He watches John's hanging, he watches the horrifically gory murder of Keith. The number of deaths is so great the faces literally begin to blur together. Flynn loses himself. 
Sam is taking over him, so dead set on justice for those killed that he's destroying Flynn. The mass hysteria is destroying Flynn. In a way though, in these moments he gets exactly what he wanted. Flynn is someone motivated by the truth. He has selfish reasons for it, but he keeps going even through death. And to an extent, he's rewarded. He learns everything. Every crime, killing, and cosmic horror is shown to Flynn in a rapid-fire fashion, but Flynn can't actually do anything about it. His only possible response is to just kill the wrongdoers after the fact, and his ability to do even that is fading fast as someone else pulls his strings. Flynn gets exactly what he was looking for, the truth about the town, but in the process he loses his agency. By the end of it, he's trying to shut his eyes and ears to the horrors in front of him as he continues to lose control of himself. And then, finally, after what feels like an eternity, you're at the lake. A young TJ sees a monster. The monster is you. You go into the water to see what happened, and to finally learn the truth with absolute certainty. And then your eyes burst. Flynn is physically prevented from learning the truth. Even when he supernaturally gains magic truth powers, he's kept from achieving his goal. It's tragic, but not like his death in TJ's route. TJ's route ends in a conventional tragedy, as conventional you can get in this game. But Flynn's route ends in a surrealist nightmare. And the best part? It still hits like a freight train emotionally. The circumstances may be the strangest in the entire game, but at its core, this is just an extension of the same dynamic Flynn has dealt with for the rest of the game. It will always be truly impossible for Flynn to receive closure. In the game's final moments, you find yourself in a closet, looking at a younger Jenna. It's the story she told Chase hours ago. Jenna asks if you're real, and slowly, you shake your head. This is a huge moment for Flynn. Having spent the whole route searching for the truth to know what is real, the game ends with him lying, denying his own existence. The horror of everything has broken him. By now, it should be pretty apparent that Echo heavily deals in trauma. But this isn't just a repeated motif. It's the core of the game. Trauma is the circle. Every route uses the trauma of the past to haunt the characters of the present in different ways. Chase kills Flynn to defend TJ, just as he killed Sydney. The fight between colonizers and the colonized is replicated through the conflict between Carl and Jenna. You tell your abuser you'll work things out again, and the mass hysteria comes back. It all comes full circle. At the same time though, Echo is beautiful. It's powerful. Even in its most horrific moments, it used that horror to affect me like nothing else has ever done before. It's a masterpiece. Echo opened my eyes to what games, what stories can be capable of, and how to truly look at and understand both. And that's a feeling I couldn't even begin to describe.